May 5th, 2015 uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen to order. I'll give a brief review of our agenda tonight. Uh, we have two proclamations uh, at 7.15, the National Public Works Week and Women's Lung Health Week. Uh, we're also going to uh, meet our newest staff member, uh, our new Director of Administrative Services, about 7.20. Uh, Kevin Bowmiller, uh, our new Veteran Services Officer, will be in at 7.30 to give us a brief report. We're going to defer the Town Accountant Report till our next meeting. Uh, she was unable to join us tonight. Uh, we have a, a new agenda item that was added, uh, permission to borrow internally, that will be taken up at 7.40. Uh, the Reading Housing Authority will be here to report at 7.45. And at 8 o'clock, we'll have an update on the Timberneck Swamp. Uh, this is the firearm safety situation uh, from our CONSCOM uh, administrator, uh, Mr. Tyrone. Uh, and then we will be making appointments to the Ad Hoc Reading Firearm Safety Committee at 8.15. Uh, we, uh, we have a liquor license transfer scheduled for 8.30 uh, to Grumpy Doyle's. Regarding Grumpy Doyle's, we also have a new liquor license request, uh, Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza at 845. That hearing will likely be open and continued because the applicant was not able to join us tonight. We will be discussing the naming of fields uh, at 9 o'clock. And then uh, the uh, Climate Advisory Committee will be in to discuss the recycle container for the lot behind CVS at 930. We will be signing an order of taking for 25 Walkers Brook Drive. That's the bus, uh, the bus stop, the long-awaited bus stop at 9:55, and then approving uh, the change of DBA from Sam's Bistro to Fusilli's Cucina at 10 o'clock. So, uh, we'll begin with uh, Selectman's liaison reports and comments. Uh, Derek, let's start with you. Um, I I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> Uh, liaison reports because I haven't been signing liaison yet. <laughs> that, that'll <laughs> change soon. Yeah. Next time I will. But yeah. I do, I, I do want to take the opportunity to kind of just sort of reflect a little bit on this last uh, on on the results of town meeting because yeah. uh, I think it kind of informs our work going forward. Um, it was interesting to see that you know if you use town meeting as sort of a representative group of folks or folks who maybe you know in tune with what's going on. It was interesting that um, Dan, when you did your presentation, that. Um, it looks like an overwhelming majority of folks are satisfied with the level of services that we have in town, do not want to see a reduction. Some folks obviously want to get, see more. more. Right. Um, and that also, this it, roughly around the same percentage of folks believe that to maintain that level of services going forward, we're going to need to have a sustainable new source of revenue. And that sort of kind of, I think, sort of informs kind of the discussion going forward. So it was interesting to kind of take a baseline temperature of where town meeting is and mm -hmm. and sort of kind of to piggyback on that Kevin and I actually wound up going to um, the Reading Education Foundation mm -hmm. fundraiser and oh other great than, I was out of town yeah. I was hoping somebody would uh, uh, other than walking out with a Keurig um, <laughs> coffee maker that doesn't fit the space <laughs> that I actually had intended for um, what was really great to see is that how hard people work um, outside of just volunteering and doing the kinds of things that they do both on the school level and mm -hmm. You know, from from uh, the PTOs to the to you know uh, education foundation, the technology foundation, folks helping seniors, um, all the booster clubs. There's a lot of ser you know a lot of services that are provided in town that are sort of off book, out of the budget. I mean, and I know that we're kind of accumulating a list of kinds of the things that we do. A large percentage of a lot of the things that we do are done by people, done by taxpayers, although. It's not in the tax bill. It's, it's folks going into their own pockets, doing things, working really hard. So as we do that, um, you know, we're kind of just seeing where we're going to go forward. Um, I want to just sort of put out that, you know, while it's great that these folks do all that, um, you know, th there could be um, what you call volunteer fatigue. We're just we're going to ask people to do so much more outside of the town budget that you know we just start to, to burn people out. So. When we do that kind of list of things, of all the things that we do and accomplish in town and services we provide for, I want to make sure that that list has things like the Education Foundation, all the things that people do outside of sort of the realm of town government. Um, and that makes sure that we, you know, kind of um, not dump more on, on, on folks to kind of maintain the services that people really want to see. So that was just kind of my take on, on town meeting and, and sort of where we might look going forward. So thanks, thanks for that. Very. 
Kevin. Um, yeah, like uh, Barry said, we we did attend the uh, that the Reading Educational Foundation Gala, which was actually like said, it was really it, it was well fun. run. It was yeah. fun. They did a great um, job. They did they did an outstanding job. Though. How were the martinis? Uh, I didn't try the martinis, they but were teeny. Um, <laughs> they were teeny martinis. <laughs> they were they they looked like shots, little little tiny little little things. But I didn't get a chance to try those. But uh, they they definitely put on a good show. It's it's, it's a very structured. Um, silent auction that they run. Uh, I was lucky, lucky recipient of the uh, 18 bottle of wine basket this uh, this year in the, in the raffle, so that was nice. Um, but in general, I, you know what Barry was saying. Um, these folks uh, did that night, um, going out and raising money. You know, again, off the books is is, is a great is a great thing to do. It's, it's nice to see these types of foundations. I know this is. One of many foundations, certainly, that we have here in town. So this was nice to nice event to attend. Um, another um, event that I attended actually with um, John Halsey uh, was the Comcast Cares Day at the uh, Burbank YMCA. Um, it was a couple weeks back. That uh, was for those who don't know, the Comcast has um, one Saturday a year. Is it one Saturday a year? I believe. John, is that right? Do you remember? Yes. Yeah, one Saturday a year where their um, employees. <laughs> donate their time and go out into the community and clean up, literally clean up the community. In this case, they were they were sweeping and raking and cleaning all the bushes and, and getting all the junk out of the surroundings over at, from the, uh, left over from the uh, piles and piles of snow we had um, over the winter um, down at the YMCA and it was a, a really nice event. Um, you saw some pretty enthusiastic employees there on their day off, um, Comcast employees there on their day off, really happy to help out. It was, again, one of those nice things to see where uh, you have a company, you know, taking a little bit of ownership um, in not only this town but but throughout Massachusetts on that same day. So that was a nice, uh, nice event to attend as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, sounds like it's a good thing we got the liquor commission being open tonight because we're doing martinis and, <laughs> <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But um, um, and you know, to report that I could not talk the Comcast people into coming over to 75 Beaver Road to continue the cleanup. <laughs> but, uh, um, and from a liaison standpoint, um, I, I was some traveling between the last meeting and this meeting, um, but I've got a couple of brief updates. Um, one is that the Recreation Committee, which will be meeting um, actually next Tuesday, has already begun a mobilization uh, project towards Creating, you know, how will, if in fact um, lighting goes on at Birch Meadow, uh, what will the operational plan be like? And so I think it's notable that they've already heard what town meeting said, which was, you know, you've got to be able to work with the neighbors mm -hmm. and uh, the committee, uh, along with some selected other users, are already exchanging thoughts and ideas and hoping to build an operational plan in, in advance of. Uh, a public uh, a public hearing which will be tied to um, a survey which is just about ready to be launched um, for birch for people that use birch meadow or live around birch meadow and so a lot of positive progress out of recreation which is kind of a old story with recreation that's what they seem to do the other thing I wanted to mention was um, it is volunteer month actually and a lot of volunteers have been recognized and um, Part of what was going on, you know, down at the Y was volunteers doing their thing and being recognized for it. But at the Pleasant Street Center, um, there was a dinner about 10 days ago, I guess. Um, and it was designed around honoring all of those volunteers that uh, caused so many things to happen at the Senior Center. And you know, um, for those here and those that might be listening, there's a stunning amount of work that's done on behalf of the seniors, that's been done on behalf of a lot of people, but, and kind of to Barry's point, there's a lot of volunteerism that is tied to that. Um, the room was full of people that both volunteer inside the center and outside the center, meaning medical, you know, assistance to rides and doing taxes and all of those things that these volunteers were doing. Um, our state representatives were there. Um, and they were recognizing some volunteers of the year that were chosen from within their own group. Um, but I, I think it's important that 
we just kind of say, I have to say out loud how heartwarming it is to see what goes on at the Pleasant Street Center, at the Senior Center. Um, and we're seeing, uh, you know, as, as we've had a reorganization internally uh, with the staff, we're, we're seeing staff members cross over between, you know, Senior Center and Recreation. And it's just, it's the partnership thing that we've been talking about now for well over a year. Mm -hmm. um, everybody working together for the common good and that way we get the most bang for the few bucks that we have to work with so, um, and I think Jane Burns is doing a wonderful job um, orchestrating that so. Thank you, John. Okay, I have a couple of items uh, this is just an email that, that came in today uh, uh, for those of you who will be attending uh, the Memorial Day ceremonies uh, Boy Scout Troop 702 I have three sons who went through that troop. Will be uh, attending. They'll be hosting a uh, well, a reception in the Higgins Hall in the Old South Church immediately after the Laurel Hill Cemetery uh, ceremonies. So just so everybody knows that, and everybody is invited. Uh, I also uh, was very privileged to attend the Outstanding Citizens. Uh, Awards ceremony uh, at April 20 on April 29th up in North Reading. Uh, the principal honoree was Camille Anthony, who sat in one of these seats, I believe, for 18 years. Uh, I served with Camille on the board way back, uh, I think, from 1994 to 98. Uh, she put a lot of time, energy, and love into being a selectman, and I think she she was very appropriately honored at that dinner, along with uh, uh, several uh, two other uh, gentlemen from Reading. Uh, Detective Justin Martell, who was uh, named Reading Police Officer of the Year, and, and Firefighter Joseph LaPola, who was named Reading Firefighter of the Year. And I got to pinch hit for our two state reps and present uh, certificates to all three of them. So it was a, a great night, a good cheer, a good time was held, had by all. Uh, Barry and Bob were able to join us. So I, I thank everyone for turning out. And uh, let's see, I had a third item here. Seems to shuffled it. Anyway, what I wanted to also do is, uh, all of you received a copy of liaison assignments. Uh, mm -hmm. Try to be fair and balanced with those, but I, I think at this point we should take a vote and just go ahead and approve what's there, uh, so we can get started. Um, is there a motion? Um, motion to is there a motion on here? Or am I no, no, one up? No. Okay. Um, motion to approve the 2015-2016. Um, uh, Board of Selectmen liaison uh, appointments. Is that second? Second. Uh, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Four zero. So is this where Arena's not here and he gets to do them all? Yeah, he gets. That's to, right. He gets all the threes that <laughs> everybody else had. Right? <laughs> I was happy not to be able to give anybody a three. That, that was one of my ground rules going forward. Uh, nobody got uh, less than fifty percent of their ones and. Uh, I, I, I try to group people by responsibility and related areas, so I, th I think it, it came out okay. Very good. Um, just a just a question, sure thing, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Um, if you're on, uh, if you're not on a, you know, assigned a liaison, yeah. uh, it doesn't preclude you from being involved. So in not at all. Uh, you can attend the meeting, but if there's already two people, you probably right, should let Bob know so he can post the meeting. Got it. Just, that makes uh, sense. Just keep the rules of engagement okay. in mind. But no, absolutely. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, any public comment on any item not on the agenda? Mr. Brown.
December 22nd, 1950, I took an oath when I enlisted in the Air Force to defend this country from enemies both foreign and domestic. I did not have to defend myself or this country from foreign enemies. But I find myself having to do so against foreign enemies such as the town court office that seek to approve the rights guaranteed me by the First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Any any further public comment? Yes. I just have a comment on that, and I, I should have shared it with you in advance, Bill. Um, I did speak to both Laura and uh, moderator Alan Poole, ten time counsel, not all together at the same time, to try to get the background for this. And I guess uh, my predecessor, at some point uh, along his tenure, had a couple of frustrating experiences with anonymous anonymous documents being left. So what he instructed that. <laughs> no, I, no, I didn't think it would be. Um, so what he instructed the town clerk at the time was to approve all handouts to make sure there was contact information. Um, after a discussion uh, this most recent time, once they saw their, their letters in the back, I think the best policy is the town clerk is going to step away from this entirely, and it's really the moderator who needs a policy. Yep. It's the moderator's meeting. He will determine what his rules are. We mm -hmm. won't have anything to do with it. He'll do what he wants. He seemed to concur with the sentiment that if someone is going to put a handout back there, back there, it should not be anonymous. There should be a name and a precinct if it's a town meeting member and some ability to contact you. And then if it's not a town meeting member, it should indicate you're not a town meeting member. Okay. Seem fair to you, Bill? No, sir. Uh, I have no problem with the moderator taking that situation. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, uh, I agree that it should be uh, on the table should be subject to what is a town meeting, not yeah. just anybody right. going in and dropping Whatever they wish. And if that's the case, then I apologize to the town clerk's office, but I think I have a point to point. Just okay. not take my First Amendment rights. Conversely, I, I'll, I'll have to exercise my second and Jimmy will do it. <laughs> <laughs> Respect the right of your fellow uh, precinct member to say what he said, too, because that actually falls under the same rubric. He's yeah. got a right to say yeah. it, although it may be you know, totally I, crazy. I may disagree with him. It's like yeah. the people are. Uh, fly the flag upside down the ground. Uh, I don't like what they do, but it's their right to do so. <coughs> what I do after the lights go on, that's another thing. Thanks for your service. But like the 95 year old gentleman in Manchester that hit the guy with the tighter seal of bullet. <laughs> okay, anything else? Uh, uh, Bob? Uh, um, I think I'll cover a couple things that Sharon would have uh, covered. Um, First, if I could ask you to make the first motion on 1C. Um, as um, you may recall from the charter discussion, the, uh, the new charter has defined a treasurer and a collector, and given the select and the authority to combine those uh, upon my recommendation, I would ask you and recommend to do that. So there's a motion if you don't mind. Okay. I move that the Board of Selectmen, upon the recommendation of the town manager, combine the powers and duties of the town treasurer with those of the town collector, and the town manager may then appoint a town treasurer's dash collector. Is that seconded? Second. To just a note, this is not a new concept. This, this was actually in place a number of years ago. So right. Separate? Yeah, and it worked out well that the two were combined in one person. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor of the motion? Opposed? Uh, motion carries 4 0. Thank you. And one other issue that starts on page five of tonight's handout. Um, I'll read, you don't need a motion, but I'll read a motion. It, it doesn't hurt to do one. Um, I want to ask you for permission to borrow internally before June 30th. Um, there are four, there are actually five documents in here. I'm only going to ask for permission on four of them uh, for two water main projects for modular classrooms and the high school retaining wall. The purpose of this is we have sufficient cash on hand to start paying bills. We borrow from ourselves. Um, over a year end, you cannot borrow from yourself, so we'll have to go through the state, probably go through a state house note is the cheapest way. Um, and this just is the most economical way to borrow. We're not earning much interest at all. There's no reason we should be paying interest. Um, and we have there, to get that done before June 30th, right? The fifth right? one is field lighting. Um, if we get your permission, we must borrow. I'm not convinced yet that when we need the cash, so I may come back to the board in June to do that if we need to. But for now, I don't want to ask you to do that. So if I might suggest a, a, a motion of move to approve internal, internal borrowing as presented. Okay. And then there are some documents that hopefully Paul has to pass around and sign. 
And are those doc well, I make that motion that we, um, I move that we approve internal borrowing as the town manager has just outlined it to us. Seconded. Second. Discussion. Yes. Uh, Bob, does um, what's the total amount of the borrowing? I see four things here, but what's the the total amount of that we're It's like two point three six five million. And so essentially, we're we're borrowing that from free cash. Until the bonds come to the bond funds come in, and uh, um, we're going to do a permanent financing approximately in one year. Uh, until then, we'll do temporary financing. We would do temporary financing by borrowing for ourselves for the whole year if we could, but it's not legal to do that over a fiscal year. So, if we have borrowed um, before June 30th, and I believe in all these ones, we'll need to, um, then we have to go out and borrow in either the public or private market. The most economical way now is to go through what's called a state house note. Um, very low interest rate, almost no origination cost. And we'll do that for the four projects that I've outlined. And we'll probably borrow through sometime in late fall. And then uh, we can extend that right through to the year or we give ourselves flexibility because we may conceivably want to issue debt in January. So is that is that a bond anticipation note? It kind of it's like that, but it technically isn't. Um, I guess a state host note is a subset of that, but a bond anticipation note is generally in the public sector, in the public markets. And, and I assume we don't charge ourselves that much interest. No, we're pretty generous. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so that two point three is essentially almost. Well, not quite half of the available free cash that we have. So, is there any danger it's kind of having a it percent get that low it, for a long And there period? is a limit. There's a limit as to how much you can borrow internally, partly based on your free cash and partly based on other things. This isn't that close to that limit, though. And is there a downside to taking that much for, for a year? No, I don't think so. I guess the downside is we forget to repay ourselves. But so far, that hasn't <laughs> happened. It, the best way is not to have to pay interest. Right. We're foregoing interest, and we're not paying interest. And generally, as I'm sure you can imagine, that's a positive, not much. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor of the motion for borrowing? <coughs> well, it's four to zero. I just found the third item under my liaison <laughs> report, so I'd like to reopen that briefly. Uh, uh, I am the uh, historical commission liaison. Uh, I'm reporting this on Wednesday, April 29th. Reading Historic District Commission voted 5-0 to deny a certificate of appropriateness to criteria and child enrichment for their proposed facility in the Summer Avenue Local Historic District. The reasons cited by the Commission include the inappropriate scale of the proposed addition and the effect that proposed alterations to the property would have on the historic character of the district. The proceedings are continued until June 17th. As it is expected, the Criterion will soon file a second application with the District Commission, this time requesting a certificate of hardship. Okay. And we now have two proclamations, uh, National Public Works Week and Women's Lung Health Week. I'll read the two and then we'll take a motion on each. Okay. Uh, this is National Public Works Week. Whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral but often unnoticed part of our residents' everyday lives, and whereas the support of understanding and informed residents is vital to the efficient operation of public works programs, such as water, sewers, streets, highways, parks, and forestry, and solid waste collection, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of residents this of this community depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these services is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public work officials and employees, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff our public works department is materially influenced by the resident's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim the week of May 17th to May 23rd, 2015 is Public Works Week in the town of Reading, and we call upon all residents and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing quality public works services to this community and to recognize the contributions which public works officials and employees make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Do we have a motion for that? 
I do. Move the Board of Selectmen proclaim the week of May 17th through May 23rd, 2015 as Public Works Week in the Town of Reading. Okay, that's seconded. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Okay. And our second proclamation is uh, Women's Lung Health Week. Whereas every five minutes a woman in the U.S. is told she has lung cancer, and whereas lung cancer is the number one cancer killer of women in the U.S., and whereas the lung cancer rate in women has almost doubled over the past 37 years, and whereas advocacy and increased awareness will result in more and better treatment for women with that lung time. cancer and other lung diseases and will ultimately save lives, and whereas Lung Force is the national movement led by the American Lung Association with the mission of making lung cancer history, uniting women to stand together with a collective strength and determination to lead the fight against lung cancer and for lung health. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim May 11th through 17th, 2015, as Women's Lung Health Week in the Town of Reading and encourage all residents to learn more about the detection and treatment of lung cancer. Move that the Board of Selectmen proclaim May 11th through the 17th, 2015, as Women's Lung Health Week in the town of Reading. That second? Second. Uh, all in favor? And uh, someone like to receive the Public Works Proclamation, Mr. Zager. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> you earned it after this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Thank you. Okay. Good job. Uh, Thanks for getting rid of all that snow. <laughs> okay, we have this one. Is there anyone here for the women's proclamation? Gentlemen, I noticed the sound check at the time and just recognizing that. I kind of noticed that I was reading it. Uh, I, I know we're the last to let you down. So, you know, <laughs> Bill? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, we now have. Um, the, I have the pleasure of introducing. I don't think they're here. Probably give it a pop. Uh, the newest member, uh, Mr. Uh, Matt Cornellis. Yes, Matt Cornellis. Hold on. Matt Cornellis, would you come up and uh, say hello? Hello. <laughs> Matt, Matt is our new administrative services director. Uh, Matt will also, I think, in short, uh, short order. Although it will probably take a while, become uh, the face to Reading of. Reading Town Government, our new ombudsman, which uh, needs to be a separate person under our new charter. Uh, Matt, it was a pleasure to participate in the interview process. Uh, you did very well in everything we threw at you. Thank you. Yeah, it was quite a process. Okay. So, so welcome. Thank you very much. So, feel free to. Thank you for the, the great sign up there. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about Max, Matt's background. Um, and thanks, Dan, again for participating. Sure. It, it was a really interesting uh, process. We we uncovered some really excellent candidates, I thought. As good a group of candidates as any position we've interviewed for since, since I've been here. Uh, and Matt was a uh, cherry on the top. <laughs> um, Matt most recently uh, worked for the state as a deputy chief of staff to the undersecretary in the uh, Office of Consumer Affairs and Biz Business Regulation. I don't know how that all fits in business card. <laughs> um, and in Matt's first day, he already wound his way through state government to solve one problem, so he's been very helpful. Um, a prior role is, is probably most similar to the one he's being asked to accomplish here. Um, he worked uh, for mayor in Methuen uh, as a chief of staff. That's a reasonably comparable job, and he did that for six years. And he's also been in your shoes, if you will, as a city councilor. And uh, Matt also has a, a law degree and a legal background. So he's really positioned very well for the department he's in charge of and for the place that the town is at right now. And, um, you know, I really look forward to having him here for, for a very long time. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. I look forward to being here. And my office is right across the hall if anybody needs me. Very close and to the And eventually there will be an ombudsman. Have you met Bill Brown yet? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, <laughs> just met him tonight, but he seems like a great gentleman. <laughs> Tell him how you like your coffee every morning. <laughs> <laughs> I have that reading my paper. At home. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure, to, pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited work. about it. Okay. Thank, thank you. Fantastic. Okay. And okay. if I could next introduce our new veteran service officer, yes. um, Kevin Bowmiller. 
Kevin. Welcome. Kevin. Welcome. Welcome. In the hot seat. Um, Great to be here. Kevin had an interesting background, I'll, I'll say, from my perspective of uh, technology and as, as a naval officer. So uh, Kevin comes to us in what is now a full-time uh, VSO position, and as was mentioned earlier, um, on that side of the Public Services Department, we're trying to do a little better job integrating, and one of the keys to that is having full-time employees to start with. So Kevin will be here as a full-time employee. Um, Kevin will be setting up the Memorial Day uh, you know, ser services, and um, it'll be a challenge where it's three weeks away, but he's already off to a flying start. Um, you know, I really look forward to, to Kevin's impact here also. Um, Kevin and Matt, I'm sure, will work together on a, on a few issues. And, um, you know, Veterans is not meant to be an isolated area. It's meant to be integrated in a sure. community area. And I think that's what I look forward to the most from the from uh, Kevin. And again, there was, a, there was a good strong pool of candidates for this position. I was very pleased. So if, if I could ask for the board to adjourn for five minutes and go eat. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, five minute recess is full. <laughs> well, thank you. It's great to be here. Okay. You, can meet you. Each, you can meet each other now.
said the two additional rooms in the district. Is it seven or nine? It's seven or nine. It's seven or nine. Okay, that's so it's a seven year offset. It's the extra two or three years. Yeah, that's basically five months. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not Accompanied with two of my board members, Lynn Hodgson, who's actually my tenant rep as well, and Timothy Kelly, who's been with me since in all the 15 years I've been there. <laughs> um, things are going along at Reading Housing Authority um, very well. We are still a retained revenue agency. Something new that I provided in front of you is um, over the last year or so, we've been uh, working diligently to have our own website. Um, available to any constituents or you know applicants anybody with questions so I find it to be I think a very user-friendly site and I just wanted to provide it to you there's five different pages on our website uh, at you know www.readinghousing.org and I think it's filled with um, lots of information not only for our seniors but for our families um, there's town links to the town information uh, there's link to applications with so much so many people going digital these days they don't even have to come into the office for an application we update it with all of our current income information uh, landlord information section 8 information and I just thought I'd provide it to the board because I think in the past we've never actually um, given them a copy of it or even made them aware that we do have a website we often refer all, anybody that calls in with questions to this website because they can not only see pictures of a lot of our grounds especially our senior development that seems to be of most interest to everybody but like I said it provides links to every housing authority and all sorts yeah. of information so that's something that's new that we maintain on a regular basis and update it as we need and I think it's very user friendly and we also have a new option that we've added that can be in 50 different languages so that we can eliminate the need for some of our interpreters at the office That's so right. they can download all the information right there in any language and we are serving a lot more um, families of you know different nationalities to come in very handy and your main facility is Tannerville but you have others around town do you want to we do we have our family them? developments that are considered state developments that are in different locations in town plus we still maintain um, unique from other housing authorities we still maintain 17 of our own um, properties that we own individually and we refer to that on a program called the RHA owned properties uh, yeah, predominantly Waverly Oaks. Oaks is actually a state development along with Pleasant Parker okay. um, the other 17 units are either you know three-family homes condos that we've acquired over the years um, through you know some linkage programs 40B developments We've purchased on our own with uh, available funding, and uh, we maintain those. And generally, we provide them. Um, I act as the landlord in those situations, and we make those available to, first of all, uh, is our Section 8 participants that are in search of housing. If, if by chance that we've exhausted our list or we don't have anyone in need, we certainly work with other local agencies and, again, house usually a Section 8 participant in those properties at affordable prices. 
Yeah, um, Lynn, thank you. Last night uh, at town meeting, one of the items that comes up every year is just uh, uh, sort of renewing the plan for the affordable housing mm -hmm. trust. Um, you know, if as the sort of the director of the housing authority, are there, do you have a wish list? Do you have, you know, if we had money, we would do this kind of thing? Because, you know, there's, you know, I'd ask the question um, sort of like, you know, I, I know what we can spend it on, but how does it grow? And I'm just trying to sort of understand like what the need is out there. If you had some thoughts on something like that, um, you know, that would further your mission. Um, we're always in the look, you know, on the lookout for additional properties to add to our inventory. Um, of course, our problem has been over the course of years that we don't readily have a large pot of money. You know, if something comes up in a hurry, you know, say, okay, where can we find that money to, you know, make an initial deposit to hold it? Um, we have in the past come across a couple of items, and we did um, make an attempt to um, borrow from the trust to, um, you know, leverage the purchase of those funds, but some, the timing obviously didn't work. Um, we have had an opportunity recently to, um, you know, come into some funds to add to that operating reserve. So if something actually does come about, we will probably have an opportunity to um, move more quickly and purchase some additional funding. Uh, prior to when I first came on, we were probably in dire need of three bedroom units. Now I can say it's, sh it's shifted a little bit and I see more of a demand for two bedroom units. So I have, you know, and it's- Was so that less of a family housing and more kind of, you know, midlife to senior? need or the 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 family uh, the units that we tend to purchase are to address family needs um our senior housing um there's a lot more senior housing available not so much even in reading i mean we have our peter sanborn place which is supportive living for seniors we have cedar Glen, and we certainly have the housing authority um <clears throat> so we do have more options it seems for seniors to direct them families however it, it's a different game we have two hundred and fifty thousand people on our Section 8 wait list. We're one, there's 250 state housing right. authorities wow. in the state of Massachusetts. There's probably now approximately 150 housing authorities that participate in the centralized wait list. Yeah. So they can, it's like one, one stop shopping. They can fill in the application, which is a one page preliminary application, submit it to the housing authority that's close to them. But somebody even from Reading that might work in Wuben will have two opportunities to come to the top of a list more quickly. So they get, most agencies give a local preference for residing in a town and for working in another town. So I think the need for family housing far exceeds our senior housing. Um, I, I simply can direct the seniors a little bit more than I can the families. And the weights on those um, you know, family programs is extensive. I actually presently probably have a 10 to 15 year wait on my state family program and the Section 8 voucher program, and that's with a preference. Um, the Section 8 program probably, you know, with, you know, we only have 125 vouchers. If I only turn over five a year, we're not placing very many people. So 125 in Reading. Mm -hmm. That are assigned to this agency. They're portable. So I mean, um, out of that 125 vouchers, 45% of them, or 50% of them now are residing in Reading. Um, I have 33% that are in close proximity, so in towns that touch Reading, and then the balance of them are in outskirts, predominantly Lawrence and Lowell. That's, a, that's about the breakdown on the, on the voucher program. Other questions? No. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming in. I uh, okay. appreciate these updates, and uh, whatever we can do to assist you, let us know. We appreciate that. We know you're here for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thank 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 Tim. We're running a little ahead of 8 o'clock. Uh, Bob, is there anything else you want to cover in your report? Yeah, I have some um, amazing news that I didn't expect to have happened, but okay. not only is the bus shelter up, the boss actually stops at it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only that, I expected. <laughs> <laughs> I expected it to take at least a year for the like bus to stop gone. at the bus. Yeah. <laughs> I was so shocked to see it, I pulled over and parked and went and sat and talked to the people that were sitting in it. What did they think? They loved it. Good. Because it was a, you know, it was a very sunny day. Yeah. And they went, wow, this is nice. You don't have to stand in, you know, in the sun. And, you know, they were a little longing for winter again, so they wouldn't have to stand in the snow, apparently. <laughs> Well, there is one. Shocking to see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I, I went by Friday night. I was on my way to uh, eat with my family at Bertucci's, and I said, oh, look, the bus shelter. Oh, look, the bus is still stopping at the old bus stop. <laughs> what are you going to do? did one of those, but I guess today it got fixed. <laughs> um, and, you know, related to that, uh, later in the agenda, you have an order of taking which will officially close this topic, I hope. <laughs> we did, did we not do that once before? Uh, you did something else, but not an order of taking. Okay. Don't we do that every week? I think, I think probably every six year months year. we'll just bring back something to you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, and, and with that, I think you can go ahead to your 8 o'clock agenda, um, okay. unless con is the cons com coming. We are waiting for the chair. Okay. 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 So you, you must be Chuck. I am. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Chuck Tyrone. We could jump ahead of minutes, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Why don't we do that? Okay, we have uh, two sets of regular minutes and uh, one set of executive session minutes. We can approve the executive session open if there are no changes. Otherwise, we must do that in closed session. Okay. Uh, have a motion for April 1st. Uh, move the floor select and approve the minutes of April 1st, 2015, as amended. And that's the uh, the meeting with the MAPC over in the uh, Pleasant Street Center, I believe. Right. Any comments, changes? Second. Is it second? Sorry. Any comments? All, all in favor? Opposed? Standing. The vote is 3 0 1. Uh, motion on April 14th minutes. Move the Board of Selectmen approve the minutes of April 14th, 2015, as amended. Is that seconded? Second. I have one comment, and it's on page six at the very top, uh, where uh, John Jarima, a member of Historical Commission, uh, just John Jarima is a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think that was supposed to be Jonathan Barnes. <laughs> so he's probably, he was an associate member of Historical. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. He was here. He was here with Charlene, yeah. I uh, just have that one change. Anybody have anything else? Mr. Barry, you were here for this one. Yep, I yeah. did. Okay. Actually, go on there. All in favor? Opposed? 4 0. Uh, motion for the executive session minutes of April 14th. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the executive session minutes of April 14th, 2015, as written. That's seconded. Second. Uh, all in favor? SBA roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. Very yeah. good. Mr. Berman? Uh, yes. Mr. Sexton? Yes. Uh, myself, yes. John? Yes. Okay, four yeses, four zero. That's approved. Okay. Are we all present? Yeah. Well, you seem to have lost one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we lost what? Okay, we need Chuck. <laughs> what else can we do? Uh, okay. 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 Sure. Uh, change of DBA from Sam's Bistro to Fusilli Cucina. We have a motion and then maybe a little background, Bob. That's so pretty straightforward. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the change of DBA from Sands Bistro to Facilities Cucina at 107 Main Street. Okay, second? Second. Okay, a uh, little background on that? Okay. Uh, as, as the name may indicate, they're changing their cuisine to be Italian. I okay. don't know if they've already changed it. Um, John and I were there within the last 10 days, and it was, it was Sam's. It was still, still Sam's. Sam's. So it's a change in order or just a change no, in the... Uh, as I understand it, the only change is the menu just and the name. The name. Menu and, and the DBA. And this is a change of DBA, so it's yeah. not necessarily going to be a new sign. Right. I, yes, that's I mean, exactly right. I mean, just oh, because they're changing their DBA doesn't mean that... Well, not Paul said they, they're probably going to do that. Are they? No. I mean, the sign and the... I think there. I would. Yeah. Within the same I know you're footprint, if you will, because... That was one of the first questions either Gene or Jesse asked. Okay. Do we have to go through the sign process? Well, the answer is no. If they do the same the same square footage, or yeah, footprint, yeah. I should say not even square footage. Are they doing any uh, internal working restaurant changing? They haven't asked to do any. Decor, they haven't filed for any permits. I don't think they in, uh, indicated they had any work to do. Okay. That's the same ownership group. And yeah. So far, you've yeah. got paperwork in front of them. Yes. Yeah. We made that motion, seconded it, right? Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor of the uh, change of DBA? San Francisco? 4 0. Can we do J also? Chuck's not there. Um, 
that need, need a little more? It doesn't. Yeah, you don't need to do a motion for okay. it. It's just a document. All right. Okay. Let me go find him. <laughs> you, you, you could adjourn again and eat. Well, we could. <laughs> Bob, we could just. I think all the timber neck folks here for the firearms thing. You well, are. I mean, we've got the chair of Conscom, but we, you know, Chuck has been yeah. part of that presentation, I think. Or maybe he, he is. It was my understanding um, that Chuck was going to be here, so. Okay. He, he has been. He's, he was just here. He's elusive. He's, he's probably gone back to his desk to call to see if I'm, <laughs> if I'm on my way. All right. Okay. <laughs> Can't really move anything else. Everything else, Everything else has been done. Mm. <laughs> well, how about that town meeting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, for those who uh, are fairly new to town meeting, what we trans what we actually did in two hours in going through the budget used to take a dozen nights. This is before yeah. the town manager was here. Every department literally had to go up and defend <laughs> their spending. Mm -hmm. And Tom Bidding was sort of the adjudicating body. So okay. we've come a long way. And uh, uh, hats off to Paul Dustin, who was our moderator, who came up with the, uh, I think it's called Ed Siri item approach, where you, In a row. you group okay. blocks of line items and vote. Yes. Okay. It seemed to flow pretty well. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah, it did. There's no money to fight over, so. <laughs> okay. I think we're all together. Yes. Okay. Good Chuck. evening. Chuck? Uh, would you like to uh, lead off the discussion and uh, introduce the members of your council? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, uh, we're here, the Conservation Commission, and okay. the abutters to Tim and X Swamp are here to yep. talk about um, the commission. Uh, well, not commission, but uh, we need to acquire some money for signs to stop non hunting, um, stop the hunting in Tim and X Swamp. So this is something I put together with my GPS and Dorothy Marshall, and we went out, and everything in this area right here was was found on this. This is the up and dry area. Most of everything else is wet, um, and we found a wildlife game camera, two tree stands, and some other things. These two tree stands have been removed. <coughs> They were seen by the uh, butters. So, to me, uh, it proves that there was historic hunting activity going on in Tabernacle Swamp pretty much um, throughout my time here, four years or so, if not longer. So, I think everyone knows somebody that might have been out there hunting or not. But um, right now, we have some tree stands. We have pictures of tree stands. We have uh, pictures of wildlife game camera, and we have a very energetic neighbors of Timberneck Swamp that do not want any hunting there, and um, have come here to make sure that you understand that uh, it's really something that the commission doesn't want, something that neighbors don't want, and I think there was 100, 100 people on your family, so 170 yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I think that this has been identified for some time as a public safety issue in Timberland Swamp. And it was just a question I, I felt of, you know, getting the proper, you know, chain of events to occur, which would be, you know, one was if we were not going to be able to get the cooperation of the private owner, which we now have, which is great, um, it was going to be a question of, getting enough signs in enough of the right places. Um, an observation of mine, just, um, I do believe there's certain regulations as to how often these signs have to be placed in order to make them enforceable. Mm -hmm. And I'm questioning whether you've got enough of them there. That's, that's, my, that's my only question. I, I mean, I don't you know, think that there's, at least from my perspective, the idea of a place that was a hunting place that really is kind of, even though it's technically, you know, okay, given the, the footage, given the footprint of homes that are around there and the children that are in 
and out of there, and the fact that it, you know, it's conservation land that should be able to be used by lots of different people. Um, I mean, the no hunting thing doesn't create any problem for me there. Um, I did, you know, my only question to you when I saw this was whether or not you've got <coughs> enough signs to actually get the job done. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I hope to limit the signs. I mean, the signs that we chose were um, more permanent signs. And to, to post them every 20 feet, you know. Is that what happen. the code calls for? It, it seems like every 20 feet. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. I haven't measured it out. Mm -hmm. would, would be a lot. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, I don't like, um, I don't think that we want to change what's happening out there just to get the word out. And I know that most, most hunters are ethical hunters, and if they knew that uh, it was posted as non-hunting, they wouldn't be in there. And um, so I'm hoping that works. I mean, obviously it might be step two, but uh, these are, there's 19 signs right now. Aren't the ethical hunters supposed to take down the tree stands after a certain amount of time also? I'm not sure. I think, I think uh, tree stands are, uh, I don't know, it's almost like marking your territory. Well, and you have the right to put them up, but you cannot leave them there indefinitely. I didn't know anything about private Well, one would question why. I mean, they're not cheap. No. I mean, no, if you're going to think that you would take them down, them, them down for purposes of you using them somewhere else. I mean, they, they, they don't grow on the trees, literally. They're, they are expensive. I thought there was also a fine for people who don't take it down to. I just forwarded it. Well, I think it's. I'm not a tree yeah. stand hunter or, or, or a hunter. Right. Fair enough. But, you know, some of these don't look like they were ever taken down. And I, and I think that there might be rules and regulations, but when you have a great spot to hunt, not this spot, some other spot, you might want to get back to where I said, which was mark your territory and uh, keep some presence there. I believe that you know, talking to the homeowner or the landowner inside of the swamp, that permissions were granted, I think, by his father. 20 years ago, which those could have been there 20 years. One of them is chained to the tree. So it's kind of territorial. But you know, that's been invoked. And maybe what we can do is maybe we can find who owns them and invite them to come and take them. Um, if after a reasonable period of time. This is part of what I think the committee's got to do is figure out how the regulations impact things like this. Um, and, you know, what can be done and what can't be done. I go back to the sign thing, and I, I get that every 20 feet is like, you know, it's like you know, having the national debt in signs, which doesn't make sense either. But, so my only question is that little spit of land that's got like eight or nine signs, and then you've got these long expanses uh, behind Belmont Street, behind Timberlake Drive, where there's no sign. Well, the effort was to put them at public access. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have the letter streets. That's at the end of the letter streets, John. That's probably yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, those are all landlocked locations along the Belmont. Well, I'm not objecting to what you're doing. I'm just wondering if you're if you go over far. Right. You know, Belmont Street. If you know, if someone. Uh, I mean, I guess. During the season, the signs could go up there also. Uh, these signs, you know, what we have out there right now, um, they're not cheap. The, the signs that you're talking about, those plastic ones that you can put up, they'll stay a couple of years. It's, it's kind of a different area um, because it's private. That A lot of that land belongs to somebody. It's blocked off by uh, the stream. So, you know, I guess the way wasn't something we thought of. It would actually, each homeowner could put up their own sign at the edge of their property. Do you have an example of the sign itself? We Which have, have uh, yeah, um, a few. You graciously um, gave us, there's a sample here. I think we had proposed to have. Are you, are you Anika? Uh -huh. I am, excuse yes. me. So Anika Scanlon, I'm chair of conservation. Um, we have voted, we've discussed this at length, and we've voted to approve this going forward twice. So I'll just okay. pass this around. Um, yes, that 
Alex Brins. Um, she went out and got pricing for it and provided us with that sample to show you. Um, Would this be a fixed on a tree or a fixed right. on a pole? On it. I mean, I think it should go on whatever's readily available at the most accessible point. As long as it is, it, one of my concerns is um, it must be on town land. You know, um, talking about property limits and, and tricky stuff like that, you know, I don't want to overreach where the town has the authority to place these signs. And I, I think there's some reasonable logic to putting them at access points. Most of that land is wet. Um, the, the first time I actually got a chance to gain access there was um, late February because it's frozen solid. And I could, I could go out there, and I actually went out with another commission member to see wh what the footprints were saying. Who's out here? Um, where are they going? You know, kind of, is there any trail of any activity here? Um, there really isn't, to my knowledge, I have not found or heard about an accessible trail that people walk in and walk out. Um, that isolated property with the purple sort of X marks on it right now. Um, that seems to contain a highland that is completely surrounded by water and wetlands. Um, and when it's not frozen, it's going to be mucky and buggy and thick with shrubs. So, um, you know, clearly people are getting in. I don't know how. I don't know where. Um, so, and I couldn't see that in the winter time. But, um, you know, I think the concerns of the residents are clear um, and consistent. And, um, and there is evidence to support what they're saying. So I think taking reasonable measures to send a message is, is a good, safe step to move ahead on. So what signs will you use to post the, uh, the private property? Because he's granted us that permission. We simply just thought no hunting would work on the private property. I mean, property. it doesn't have to be. We. I mean, it shouldn't be by order of the <coughs> no. Conservation Commission. He's, we, he's a private person. We did. We did consider at the last meeting. Perhaps the sign should read "No hunting per order of the property owner," because that covers conservation, town ownership. It also covers this, this person. So that they could be used inside and along the boundary. Um, so that's an option. Clearly, huh? his letter to us clearly allows yeah. that to happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's not a difficult fix on the sign design. Okay. Just as a, just as a quick question, did anybody actually look into is if there's any language we need to have, specific language, the state? I haven't. I don't. I, I, I don't we, sure. we have not enlisted um, the town council or yeah. any in any official okay. regard about this. I would um, just uh, caution make sure that you know, there is some official language that, that, that needs to use to make it more enforceable. We've discussed, we've discussed, had a couple discussions with the police department mm -hmm. about this coming, you know, on a couple of different aspects of it. Um, and to my knowledge, they didn't suggest okay. text. I didn't have those discussions. Can we check with Fish and Game to see if they've got language? Because they might. We can check. Yeah. You know, I, I, think I only bring it up because we've been or tripped or up over language in okay. regards to this, I think to this issue before. So I think our proposal, and, and we can definitely follow up on that. Okay. Um, I, no objection to that. I think the intent of that particular language is keep it simple. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Keep it simple. It's not uh, confusing, yeah. not ambiguous. And Chuck, you mentioned you're seeking funding from the board. Do you have an estimate of what you're looking for? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have two estimates. One is for reflective signs, and one is for non-reflective signs. The non-reflective signs are about three hundred sixty-five dollars. Should I? Sure. You sure. Can. Yeah. Um, what are the numbers? Okay. Just okay. Wait. So, so the non-reflective was um, the estimate was four fifty-six, um, and reflective background um, six fifty-five fifty. Um, and, and, and is that for all? That's for all oh, the signs. Right. All not the just the ones per Conservation Commission, but the, just the no hunting. Not, well. not the purple ones. Not the purple ones. No, no, no. That's, that's the red. Is for all. There's 19 signs total yeah. 
on the private land and on the conservation oh, land, and food. that's for the for all signage. Okay. Yeah, you just have to use different wording. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, who who would actually do the work and pound these signs either in the ground or on a tree? Would that be the, the homeowner, or the landowner up there, or is it you guys? We have or board of selectmen? Or? I think we have 170 volunteers that would be happy to sign <laughs> and get these things on a tree or a pole. So I don't think that's a problem at all. So uh, whether it's DPW, conservation, or the uh, active the butters, uh, it will happen. Well, what are our options for paying for this, aside from a reserve contract? Uh, the, the, the town manager has a uh, rainy day fund, which that's more information than you needed to let out. If I can just add, um, as a general rule on conservation land, I, I think um, I think permission to be there is um, restricted and removed after sunset. Um, so, um, reflective, I, I mean, I think you could for the sake of, I don't know if that adds some longevity to the signs or not, um, but truly, I, I think, you know, something you can see during the daytime, something that's clear, it was almost a, a hazard yellow, um, you know, kind of color-coded to the beware message. Um, I don't think that's, it's my personal opinion. I'm not, it's not on behalf of the board. It's just my personal opinion. I, I don't see a reason to go for a reflection. So. My, my concern is that some of these signs um, uh, may not last for a variety of different reasons. You know, maybe it makes sense to water some kind of spares that if some get taken down or just row wings um, that they could be replaced without having to come back to the board of selectmen. So, you know, is there, you need 19, Found you price 25, you know, just have them in somebody's garage in case. And they see the, the non-reflective ones are $24 each. So. How long does it take to get the sign? Probably a couple days. Well, you know what, uh, we have Bren Burkhardt here, who did a lot of that okay. um, background work. Maybe sure. you'd like to talk about that? So I pulled um, the Reading Parents Network Facebook page to get um, suggestions for vendors and contacted all the vendors I got, got about five of them. Um, the turnaround on signs can be three to five days, so it should be easy. If I could just say, I would probably pitch for the reflective material, um, although it is a little bit more. I think as residents of the area, we've had concerns about possible hunting at night. Um, so I do think for anybody who might be wanting to kind of get in there at night, it might might be a deterrent. I don't know. I don't think the cost differential is that great, but well, is it still the same um, the same color? That, that's up to you. Is it the same color? The only reason I ask, you know, I, I assume somebody who's unlawfully going in there at night isn't really flashing lights to anyway. get a get a reflection off the sign. I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. I haven't seen like a reflective type in that color. Or, yeah. But I, I would assume it would have a slightly different look to it. Yeah. It's, just the, a, the it's a layer. That goes the, on the, top sample of the, yeah. 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 the sample you have is reflective. The sample you have is reflective. Yeah. 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 You make it whatever color you want. So you can go that, that um, yeah. color of the sign that's on there. Correct the yellow. Well, yeah. you know, again, I can only speak for myself. If, if the neighborhood is going to feel more comfortable at six hundred and fifty dollars than four hundred and fifty, then let's just do the six fifty. Yeah. I mean we're not we're not talking about yeah. any money here in the relative sense of I mean you know I mean if there was six hundred and fifty dollars on the ground I would bend over and pick it up. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> However, in the bigger picture of trying to, you know, make the neighborhood address the public safety issue and have the neighbors feel more comfortable. Um, this is not. This sign is not going to stop somebody that nefariously wants to go into the woods and shoot stuff. Yeah. You know that's a different problem. But this will clearly stop hunting. Um, you know, from the standpoint of those people who are, you know, hunters who respect the law, and that, and you know, most of most hunters do. 
most criminals do not. So. Now, the police having a sign that will also give a reason to enforce the no hunting. My understanding is nobody can be prosecuted for hunting right now if there are no signs to tell them they cannot do that. Right. Right. That so is correct. That would help it the enforcement issue that we face. Quite the opposite, actually. They have to get posted. you got to get the signs up. Mm -hmm. that, that's important. Well, just to, real quick to Barry's point, is there another mechanism other than ordering them up front for them not to have to come back before the board if the sign is taken down and they don't have to come to the board at all? Okay. Cool. I just want to get away from you know, order as needed rather yeah. than that. Yeah. No, so that's not a clever way of saying money. we don't have a budget. He yeah. does. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right up till June 29th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any, any other questions? Comments from the neighborhood. Uh, just curious, uh, any other incidents have been reported lately? Or any sounds coming from the swamp? I haven't yes, since uh, mid March. They seem to coincide with daylight savings when we turn the clocks back in okay. the end. It starts in late November, and I think it has to do with darkness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> has to do with what? How, how early it gets dark. Oh. It goes November, late November till mid March, generally. Okay, well, uh, thank you everybody for coming in tonight. We will be doing the appointment of the uh, Ad Hoc Reading Firearms Safety Committee. Uh, we welcome the state for that. Do we make a motion? I don't think we no. It sounds like he is urging uh, the town manager to, 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 to get out his piggy bank and, and write a check. Yes, um, that's great. Okay. All right, well, thank you very thank much you. for listening yeah, to us. Thank you, folks. Thanks a lot. Very good. So you might want to take some pictures as you're uh, laying them up so everybody knows they're there. Uh, yes, I might. Um, I think that's, that's a good idea. A couple of pictures with our new administrative services director. We get an article in the newspaper. You know, it's always good to spread things like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the ignorant hunter can say, oh, okay. Sounds good. You get a couple of pictures and. Uh, I'll volunteer to do <coughs> the sign, so you okay. know. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Thank you, Nika. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I don't yeah. know if you've made a vote. Can I just say one more thing? In terms of who would put up the signs, I do think, in because I had looked at where they could possibly be placed. I think if DPW could put them up, I mean, if a sign like yeah. that needs to be drilled into something, I had told Chuck when I called him that we had neighbors who were willing to do it, but I think probably better for DPW. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I suggest Chuck go with. Yeah. And all My guess is you're better off putting them on a stake than you are yeah. on a tree. I think so. I mean, it just they're going to stay up longer. They're going to be less easy to pull down. I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons why you have the guys that put signs up, put them up. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I wouldn't want people going into a tree for the conservation. Yeah, exactly. I know everyone. <laughs> everyone says that. <laughs> <laughs> Although those tree stands look like they've kind of done some damage. Yeah, those so. tree stands have been there a long time. The straps are very tall. Which were on conservation land and not on the private land. So, thank you. All right, thank, thank, you. thank you. you. Thanks for your persistence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Our next uh, agenda item is uh, the appointment to the ad hoc firearm safety committee. Just, just a reminder to uh, all who may not have been following this: uh, it, the board of selectmen created the <coughs> ad hoc writing firearm safety committee to extend through the end of the year. Uh, it, there will be seven vacancies to fill. Uh, they will consist of two, the membership will consist of two members from the Board of Selectmen, the police chief or designee, and uh, you've designated uh, Chief Cormier, you've designated Chief uh, Sagala to the, to the board. Uh, one town meeting member and three residents at large that may not fulfill any requirements listed above. The Board of Selectmen will attempt to include in those members at least one resident from the Timberneck Swamp neighborhood. The purpose of the committee is to, one, suggest strategies that shall improve the safety of nearby residents and travelers through the neighborhood of the Timberneck Swamp. Two, investigate the history of the Timberneck Swamp and how it was designated conservation land with an island of private land in the middle of it. Three, review General Bylaw 8.9.1 and draft a revision that protects the rights and interests of all town citizens. And four, report its progress to the Board of Selectmen by August 2015 in order to determine uh, what, if any, t November town meeting action will be requested. Uh, this evening, uh, Kevin and I, uh, who 
members of the subcommittee, the uh, volunteer, the AFC. Appointment. <laughs> volunteer appointment uh, subcommittee. Uh, we had seven candidates, uh, six appeared for an interview tonight. Uh, all were interviewed. Uh, we only have Grin as the one neighborhood resident of all the applicants. Uh, we did, in fact, have three town meeting members. Yep. Uh, so we, we had a surplus of uh, surf, surf, surf and wealth there, the town meeting people. Uh, Kevin, would you like to uh, make the motion? Sure. Uh, move that the Board of Selectmen confirm the Volunteer Appointment Subcommittee's recommendation to appoint the following to the Ad Hoc Reading Firearm Safety Committee with terms expiring December 31st, 2015. Jonathan Scully as a town meeting member, Bryn Burkhart as a resident at large, David Panette as a resident at large, Kenneth L Lafferty as a resident at large. Ken, I will add, is also a town meeting member. Uh, uh, in town meeting member. Right. Should I keep? Uh, yes. All one motion? Okay. Uh, you need to and, continue there. Uh, move that the Board of Selectmen appoint uh, Kevin Sexton and John Halsey as the Selectmen representatives on the Ad Hoc Reading Firearms Safety Committee. I guess those are two separate motions. So we'll, we'll take a second on the first one. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, any discussion? Uh, um, the only discussion I would say to the, rest, to the fellow board members, um, you know, we, we definitely had a good, um, out of, of the candidates that came in tonight, we had a a nice amount of folks to select from. I think the uh, volunteer appointment subcommittee, the names that we've put before you here represent a very fair balanced uh, committee. I think that uh, have both an interest in um, seeing the safety of, of uh, the town uh, as well as uh, the property rights of owners involved. And I think it will be a, uh, a very good committee with uh, a lot of good discussions. All right. We would expect this committee to be meeting uh, probably once to twice a month through the beginning of the summer, maybe slack off a little during the summer and then pick it up again. Not that we wouldn't yeah. do anything in the summer, but I think, yeah. you know, with the summertime well, obviously yeah. Feel free. has uh, challenges from a um, from getting everyone together standpoint. But yeah, I think uh, before, as many as we can get in before the summer. Uh, and I think uh, as you and I discussed, one of the first points of orders on night one would be to try to lay out a schedule so we can try to get, um, get as many uh, in. Um, depending on the discussions and how they go uh, would also probably facilitate how many we think we're going to need to have moving forward in the future. Okay. Well, the goal is uh, end of August, I think, as I remember the. I, th I think, Bob, when do we need original, we're going to report the original to plan was town the, meeting? Uh, September, in the, somewhere in the 20s, we have to close the warrant. Right. Okay, so, so that's when we want an article, it really needs to be done the, in August. And the, gone the, to town the group town needs town. to report to the board by the end yeah. of August. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it can be a. Work in progress, but it needs, yeah. you have to report. I think that uh, part of the other resolution that formed the committee was looking for every two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that summer's going to come, and that's, yeah. you know, I mean, we're going to need to keep a quorum together and, and try to be, we'd like to, I think, like to keep as many people from the committee at every meeting as Absolutely. possible so that, you know, everybody's represented, and I think that's the goal. So um, we'll see if we can get everybody to bring their calendar. And, See if we can lay that out and get those posted for the for the summer. Uh, further discussion, Bob. Um, I just have a question for especially the two selectmen members. Um, I suggest you come up with a first meeting date, mm -hmm. um, so that Paula, when she sends out a letter to the fort, okay. can just say this is the first meeting yep. and do the best you can and get there. Um, then, as you you should organize the committee, have a chair and a vice chair at least. Mm -hmm. yep. And then have the chair or vice chair go through Paul or Caitlin or myself to schedule meetings and to reserve rooms and all those logistics. Okay. Uh, I think in that regard, from the discussion we've had of the the folks uh, that we interviewed tonight, Mondays and Wednesdays seem to be the better nights yep. uh, to have it on. So um, you guys can we'll put our calendar together. You and I can get it. Together yeah, Paul, when, when are you going to send these out tomorrow morning, or just wait? We'll we'll give you a heads up. Maybe you can put it all at the same time. We'll get the first meeting. I'll send it out. Okay. I we'll think sooner. Yeah, you we'll and I'll sure. just we'll get you know, together. We'll pick a first date, and then as a committee, we'll lay them out from there. But it sounds like Mondays and Wednesdays, which is good since we meet here on Tuesdays. So yeah. Okay. Well, we did get a second on that that first motion. Uh, uh, I don't the think four so. Is that seconded? Uh, for uh, yes, I'll Jonathan second. Scully, Brent Burkhart, David Panette, Kenneth Lafferty. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? The vote is 4-0, and uh, I, the second motion's already been moved. Is that seconded to second. 
appoint Kevin Sexton and John Halsey as the selectman reps for the discussion. This lines up with their liaison assignment. So, uh, all in favor? Four zero. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, the, the balance in, in my estimation, uh, Doris, would be um, obviously Bryn being a representative of, of the community. Um, Jonathan Scully seems to be, uh, Jonathan Scully is a, um, said he is a hunter uh, in town. David Panette really is um, somebody who doesn't really have a skin in the game either way. Uh, he's, he's really good. Um, and he's on, worked with them before. He's worked with, yeah. with both sides. He's, he's interested in, in getting a resolution that is fair and equitable for everyone. Uh, involved um, and Kenneth Lafferty um, while an, an admitted gun owner I believe he said is um, is not a hunter is that correct right. yeah. yeah I just want to I just want to say that um, you know, there are 17, I think 17, in Reddick, and of the 17,000 I think 96 are hunters and when we just tried to pass that little amendment requiring Selectman approval in order to we had such opposition and again it only affected eight property owners so all of these people who came out in, in opposition to it were hunters who professed they were you know rallying to the uh, for the property owners but again no property owners came out in opposition to it so right. Ms. Marshall it. This, this was an open process available to anybody in your neighborhood including yourself mm -hmm. so I, I, I was quite frankly surprised myself that there were no other names from the neighborhood. Well, I just think it's gonna, you're going to have a hard time hmm. because if we couldn't just pass that little amendment um, that required select and approval, I think it's Well, this is, this is a different process, though, Dorothy. This is really a process where you're bringing in um, people that have an interest on either side of that, of, that, of what happened in, in, in January town meeting. And, you know, in, in this town, from, my, from what I've found is when you when you put together a committee like this, that, that really is a, uh, what I feel is a really good committee. I, I do, I think you're getting some really level heads uh, that are gonna be in this mm -hmm. room and, and having the discussions. You get a lot more from the residents. You certainly get a lot more from town meeting members. If there's anything that you need to present to them at that point, because at that point you've really gone through and you've made sure that all interested parties have had a say and a collective has come up, come from that um, scenario. So I think it's good, it would be I, a little no, bit different. I understand that, I, I think, but um, just saying it might be difficult. It, yeah, it, it still may be. It's, be a long it still may be. Yep. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I need to echo the the chairman's remarks that this was an open process, and we had one person from the Timberneck Swamp area apply to the committee, and we're th very thankful for that. Um, but beyond that, I, I think that we can't lose sight of something. You have group of Reading citizens who are operating under an instructional motion from the town meeting to do a series of four items. Now, none of those items under instruction mirror the warrant that, you know, that didn't pass. There are clear instructions from the town meeting as to what it is this committee is supposed to do. And I believe that we've got responsible people, to echo what Kevin said, um, who are quite happy to look out for the, you know, for the best interest of the town of Reading. Um, I, I, I don't have a sense that it's specially interested. Um, there is clear marching orders as to what it's supposed to be. None of those marching orders happen to reflect the exact terms of the warrant, but you know that. That instructional motion came from the town meeting for a reason. It rejected that warrant and instead wanted public safety, wanted to have an understanding of the history, wanted to understand going forward what should we be doing in order to avoid this in the future. And at a certain point, you got to let the public process unfold and let the people who have agreed to do that do it. The beauty of this is every one of these meetings will be a public meeting. Uh, Mrs. Marshall, you or anyone else would be more than welcome to come and observe and listen and, you know, there'll probably be a, a public comment section. I mean, frankly, I'll be a member of that committee and I would vote as we set up our operating rules 
that we have a public comment Absolutely. section just exactly the way we have it now. Yep. So that if somebody wanted to come in and voice an opinion, they'd be able to do so. So um, I think before we set off an alarm, let's let the process you know, wind its way and, uh, and see if we don't get a good result. My suspicion is we will get a good result. One other thing? Um, I sent you folks uh, an, an email last week um, just saying that the fine for discharging a firearm illegally in Tibernex Square is correct. It's fifty dollars. Yes. But for for me to have a contractor use a nail gun you know, on my property on a Sunday is three hundred and fifty dollars. So <laughs> it's got to be so. A, a uh, and so, Mrs. Marshall, that would be a great that would be a great example at the first meeting of this committee to make a public comment because we did receive an email from you and did follow up the next day with the chief of police about that, and we found something out. We found out that because there has never been one fine, it's never been looked at, and that particular fine predates, that $50 fine predates um, the current prevailing wisdom of 300. Yeah. Now, could that be moved to 300? Sure. Of course. Would that likely be in a, you know one of the recommendations of the committee? I'm a member of the committee, and I would recommend it. I mean, it just it does make sense. You've you've identified a, a flaw in the you know in, in the updating, and there are there are many things to be updated. So, okay. we were about to take a vote on the designation of uh, Mr. Sexton. I think we already no. I have it as four zero. We already did. Is it taken? Yep. Oh, okay. It's taken four zero. Very good. Okay. Uh, We'll be getting out the first meeting date to the group, and we yep. thank you all for your we'll get, interest. We'll get in touch with you right away. Stay tuned. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. As a, the appointed hour has come for the Grumpy Doyles. Uh, yes. We need a um, beef motion uh, here. Any motion? Is it a hearing? No, just a motion. Excuse me. We have to open the hearing, right? We have to. Yeah. Is there? Yeah, there should be a notice in your notice. Yeah, probably in the packet. All right. Give me a second here, folks. Oh, got it. Wait. Yep. It is um, 5F1. That's page. That's my other mic. Is that the right one? Make sure I'm reading. Yeah. Okay. Um, to the inhabitants <coughs> of the town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on May 5th, 2015 at 8.30 p.m in the Selectman's Meeting Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on the transfer of an all-alcohol liquor license from FIDA Corp, DBA, Grumpy Doyle, um, to Unagi, is that a correct pronunciation? Unagi. Unagi, thank you. To Unagi Services, Inc. at 530 Main Street. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the Town Manager's Office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesdays from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and is attached to the hearing notice on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on May 5, 2015 to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, could we have the applicant introduce themselves and members of their team, please? Yes, um, I'm attorney Trish Fonsworth. To my left is Henry Parisu, the proposed manager. And mm -hmm. to his left is Scott Cantor, <coughs> who's with Neighborhood Restaurant Group okay, that thank operates you. restaurants. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we've received your information in our packet, as well as the, in the personal information sheet that was submitted as revised. Uh, but there was a revision on question three uh, without further explanation. Uh, is there a reason why uh, the applicant needed to correct that response? Yes, it was uh, it was an error. It was correct. It was initially checked off no, um, but it is the correct answer is yes. Uh, the applicant the quest the way the question is phrased, it's not clear if it's is that just in Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. Is it conviction? Is it and it was an old an old matter. So. Uh, was brought to our attention and uh, a new one was submitted. Have, have we received that paperwork, Chief Bob? It's in page 16 of your packet tonight. Okay. So it's, it's simply a yes checkbox on question three instead of no. Okay. Dated uh, 5 4. 
Right, and there was an, an, a, a page two to that mm. that explained why it was checked yes. Yes, okay, yeah, page 17. Okay, so that. Uh, Chief, have you had a chance to review this? I did not see the uh, second page, I right? only know that the plot was changed. So you you have you do not have sufficient information yet to make an, an affirmative finding. Uh, on this? I think I think the information that you have in front of you would be up to you at this point to determine whether or not you know you need any further information than what you got in front of you. Uh, can, can you give an approximate date? It was 2000, approximate date? 2002. 2002, okay. yeah. <clears throat> okay, the board has, can take one of several directions here, either if you feel you have sufficient information to proceed with, with uh, the motion, uh, you may close the hearing and vote. If you feel there's additional information you need to make that decision, we should continue the hearing to a time certain. Uh, so really up to you. You have a preference, Chief? We'll, no, okay. Bob, do you have any input? No, I think it's up to the board to either feel comfortable or not mm -hmm. with the information you receive. If you're not comfortable, uh, certainly the police can be asked to do more research and find or not find more information bring that back to the board but the board should always feel like it has full information before it makes any decision that's always been true I guess I'd probably want to understand the incident that initially had the box marked yes and uh, get a sense of that um, but why it was marked no and then you mean why was it marked no uh, uh, originally no and then yes. no yes yeah hmm. Yes and no, and no, then no, yes. Then yes. So you're asking the reason why that happened? Yeah, I just. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it, just yeah, it was our understanding, you know, my office prepares those forms. It was our understanding that, you know, we asked and understood it to be no. Um, and uh, Mr. Paris has actually been approved uh, as manager on other liquor licenses mm -hmm. here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, you know, within the past few years as well. So has been working, you know, in the industry. There has been no issues whatsoever. But um, when it was brought to our attention, we immediately corrected it and explained it. And there was no intent to hide So on these other uh, license applications, have you checked no to those? Yes. You've always checked no. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, apparently nobody ran the background check to cause that to the background checks are always run by the ABCC, and this has never come up. And so that's why I feel confident that my office, you know, we check it off. No well, one's that, ever. It does beg a different it. question. I mean, I mean, if you know you had, you know, a violation, why wouldn't you say yes? I mean, can I speak? <laughs> I went through this process for a previous company. Yeah. Explained the whole thing to the attorney to represent the company. <clears throat> she went through the whole process and said, it's fine the way it is. Check no, sign, and, and go. You know, I didn't. I was never trying to hide anything from anyone. You know, I went to the attorney and just said, you know, I have an OUI from 2002. If you need to do something with that, you know, it's out there. Just so they they went through the whole process, and that's just the way. It <coughs> but, but I guess. Uh, yes, my name is Scott, <coughs> Scott Cantor, I represent David Rosenberg, who is the sole shareholder of the LLC. Um, I've been in the restaurant real estate finance business enough so that I've lost most of my hair. Um, we are uh, part of the neighborhood restaurant group, which is also part of a organization where we have uh, we've had up to about 2,000 people working in our real estate business uh, up and down the East Coast. And we've learned, my partner and I, over the years, that it's all about the people that you hire. As part of the neighborhood restaurant group, we are very much an integral part of every neighborhood that we come into. And bringing ourselves into your neighborhood, we realize that we're bringing our employees, <coughs> our value system, and our reputation into Reading as we have done in South Boston and Newton. And we are also uh, opening a place in Boston Bright. Uh, we're also scheduled for another place up in Andover. 
So um, we have been through several managers as we've grown through the organization to find the right people in the right position. Because at the end of the day, every community is made up of individuals and um, the way we operate in our community, those individuals usually end up as our customers and patrons. So whether it's a barkeeper who's serving alcohol that has to understand that it's not about the last three dollars of a poor that she bought, it's about making sure that people get home safe, it's about being a good neighbor to make sure when people are outside they, uh, they don't have an issue with congregations and, and leaving it one o'clock in the morning. Um, we've never had a violence or any situation with the police um, and we bring Henry to the table with uh, what we consider our, our vetting process. It has been what, about a year and he has brought a slew of people, whether it's from Legals and Jerry Remy's. We have employees knocking down our doors because we have a great let's say a great family atmosphere within our restaurants and I think we've all made mistakes we've, we've all done things uh, that have you know maybe shaped our past a little bit but when we've uh, sat and worked with Henry we've come across as you do at you know midnight one o'clock in the morning uh, situations that require a tough call and Henry has always made that tough call uh, my partner sleeps at night uh, I'm usually watching the midnight oil and Henry's on the ground uh, monitoring the people that he's put in charge. So uh, I do appreciate your concern. I think I, we realize that your job is to protect your constituents, <laughs> sorry. And it's also important that the police know um, that we are the gatekeepers. We are responsible. We hold ourselves out to be accountable. And uh, again, we appreciate this opportunity. We're very excited to coming to Reading. We think uh, that location is great. Uh, when you see some of the packages that we have to show you what we do, um, it becomes a very exciting neighborhood place. Uh, we're excited to have the patio, we're going to change the exterior, and we're going to invest a fair amount of capital uh, into the area because we've picked Reading for the same purpose that we picked South Boston, and that we, we picked Newton, uh, we're picking Andover. It's a great community which really feeds off of families and entertainment and community. You'll find that in our restaurants we have large communal tables so that people can sit together. Um, we're really, uh, we're not a club. We don't have a club atmosphere. Uh, and, uh, you know, things like brunch and early dinners and servicing the community. We have uh, part of our value systems to give back to the community. So we also make charitable donations to local communities. We've done it throughout <coughs> South Boston. We've hired Southie kids to help do our PR and marketing. Uh, so we really try to, we go to local vendors, we go to the community for support, we give back uh, as part of our charitable uh, mission. We support softball, baseball, hockey, lacrosse. Uh, so we really are looking forward to coming to Reading and finding out you know, how we can help you because uh, we want to be a part of the community. And, uh, I will stand behind Henry. He is a formidable operator. He's got a great value system. I think his wife is due in about a month and a half. And uh, so again, I, uh, I appreciate your consideration. Mr. Paris, so the, there have been no subsequent incidents no, of this kind or any other? No. Okay. Well, Yes, Bob. Uh, if, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, I think there's there's many courses the board could take, but I would suggest you only consider two. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to move to approve the liquor license transfer as presented, and the other is to, uh, and, and that will be after closing the public hearing, and the other is to not close the public hearing and move to continue the hearing to the next meeting in two weeks. We know. would have to ask for specific new information if we did well, that. Well, the police chief has said this information area hasn't seen, so whether the board thinks that's relevant or not, it's up to you. But it, but it is only two weeks from now as far as that goes. I, I would not suggest any other course other than those two. So do we not have an a incident report from that night? Something we don't have? Uh, I have in your packet on 17 is all I've seen, and I, and I guess the chief hasn't seen page 17. Uh, no, would that is that something that you can request? That's, that's um, 
this here. With or it, and or able to get. With, with information from the applicant, we could. Right, that's what we provided. Okay. Okay. We provided that. Okay. We this um, came to our attention yesterday when um, Officer Abati called me to let me know that um, the quarry report had come back. You know, I had assumed that it was an error, and I <coughs> called immediately um, Mr. Parasu, who said, "Oh, you know what? You're right." And he explained it to me, and I said, "We have to you know, get this in right away with an explanation." And he did it immediately this morning. And we're not we're hiding anything. I don't know nope. if there's more yeah. that you need to know on that. I don't. Yeah, I don't know either. All right, why don't, why don't we uh, have the secretary offer a motion? I, I, I have a little more discussion. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, um, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Um, I, I'm certainly not questioning your restaurant group's commitment to writing, nor am I questioning your character um, or your ability to run a good restaurant. A um, couple of things come to mind. Um, one of the responsibilities each of us has is that we do everything that we can to properly vet something as important as a liquor license. So for me personally, a couple of things come to mind. I get that people make mistakes and that was then and this is now and, and on we go. And I, and I honestly do feel strongly about that being not something to be held against someone. Um, the two things that, that rise for me, um, one <coughs> is if you make a mistake, you don't lie about it, okay? And you've been, you know, patently lying about this for some time based on attorney's advice by what you're just telling me. I would suggest to you, find a new attorney or get or stop listening to that attorney. Kind of the honesty works a lot better. Um, and in this case, it would have been, you'd have been skating through here from my perspective. So I just put that out to you as, in my role as one of the commissioners you know, for a liquor license. The other thing that comes up for me is I, I trust implicitly uh, the judgment and the ability to be able to um, take a look at each and every one of these things as exercised by not only our chief but his entire staff. The fact that this was answered wrong caused, you know, a last minute change, which now leaves the chief of police or any of his representatives without having ever seen this. That oh, I'm well, I, and what I'm looking at has been redacted. So, you know, I, I for one, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's things missing from, and I don't know whether that's a social security number yes. or a date of birth yes. or yeah, a, that, that's reasonable. is that what it is? Okay, so, well, I guess what I'm saying is my personal opinion, I say this to, you know, to my fellow select is that I have no no interest in creating an adverse decision for this for this emerging business. I do think, in light of you know the the last minute yes no, and now our chief of police has not had an opportunity to review this. I personally would you know would continue this for two weeks. We're back in two weeks, and and then we get this all cleared up, and everybody's on one page. And, or everybody's thrilled that uh, you know the owners are coming to town and, yeah. and, and it transfers. I mean, that would be f from my perspective, and I'm one of four people sitting here. But that's the way I that's the way I look. So at you it. you would support a continuation, and give the police full yeah, opportunity. Yeah, because it, I, you know I I I take th these folks at their word that what's going to happen here is that when Chief Cormier or his staff are able to you know process this. Um, everything's going to come back clean and good, and you know we're happy to have a new business in town, and then it's done. I mean, I, I think that's the right way to do it instead of trying to kind of force something a little prematurely, given the circumstances of the last 24 hours. That's, that's just that's my opinion. Let, let me give a slightly different take on your first point. I, I, w I think saying that there's a lie here is a little strong. I think there's a reasonable interpretation of what they mean by a state federal mm -hmm. military crime and it might be on those on that wording that the decision hung if it said any crime it might have been a different answer <coughs> so there, there's always that to take into account <laughs> so 
little bit of the definition of is is I understand. Yeah, I'm just kind of a you know I mean it kind of says in black and white yeah. something here yeah. that was answered incorrectly. If if lie, if saying a lie is the, is too strong a word, I defer to that. Uh, but it was answered incorrectly. Correct. And, it was. And so you know there may be a misunderstanding. I'm not clear as to how you would misunderstand that question, but I, I'm happy to give the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Um, but I, <laughs> my opinion is. That I, I mean, I think because what happened was in California, and this prior attorney must have thought the question only applied here in Massachusetts. I really don't know. But Henry was was not trying to hide anything. And immediately when we found mm -hmm. out, this information and end explanation was, was emailed to Officer Abati this morning at 10 a.m. All right, so if, if we continue this, you would be prepared to... Uh, Supply a full affidavit as is required in the application. Uh, that, that's in the small print here. The affidavit must include the city and state where the charges occurred, as well as the disposition. That needs to be forthcoming. Will I'm it sure be? Sure, we can do that. Uh, we're happy to do anything. Henry's happy to meet with the chief. Whatever. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to just follow the process and do what it says in print here. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what it says you need to do. So, if we continue, that's what I would want to see. Barry, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I just, you know, again, lapse of, lapse of judgment happens in, in, in all of our lives, and um, I, I still, um, but it was an incident that happened 12 years ago, right. and it looks like for the past 12 years, I mean, you've had a successful career in the restaurant business according to, to your resume and your, and your, and your, your bosses who have to live with the decisions that you make seem to be pleased with you. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, it's also a, la a lapse in judgment and not to be forthcoming. So I, for one, would want to know, you know, the incidents, the incident that was involved and, and feel comfortable that the chief and his staff have looked at it. Um, but I, I certainly <coughs> would not vote negatively because someone had a lapse of judgment when it looks like you were probably 12 years old. Um, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> You know, but, but again, if the lapse of judgment was compounded by sort of, I mean, the question to me is pretty clear, have you or not? And, and it looks like you've been checking that box for a long time. So I'd want to kind of understand more about the incident before I'm comfortable voting yes. So I, I would move to continue. I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Secretary. <coughs> um, Actually, I have, uh, is that in our packet? I have it in the packet, yes. Okay. Um, move to continue the hearing on the liquor license transfer from uh, Fighter Corp DBA Grumpy Doyles uh, to, uh, I'm going to butcher this name again, please. Unagi. 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 Mm -hmm. I keep wanting to say Unagi, not Unagi. To Unagi Service Inc. DBA as Biltmore in Maine at 530 Main Street to May 19th, 2015 at 8.30 p.m. Is that second? Second. Okay. Discussion. Uh, I just, just real quick. Um, I, again, I don't. I think you're probably getting the express from the board. This isn't really uh, a knock so much on, on having you to town. We're welcome to have you to town, uh, but more about the process in which yeah. we, we kind of vet things going forward. And it's not certainly a knock, Henry, on, on you whatsoever. Our comfort level is to have full disclosure, especially um, when liquor licenses are involved, uh, and that it allows us to make a better decision, more informed decision uh, for the residents of this town. So, you know, I wanted to. You know, this this is more of a a um, just a, a a mild bump in getting uh, that that full welcome mat to town. So that's the only answer. I, I don't even think it's a bump. I think it's form over substance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, the form. It, you know, we've got a problem with the form here. And yeah. you know, frankly, as one of the liquor commissioners, I, I got to get it right. Yeah. I mean, I just owe it to everybody to get it to get it right, and and to you folks as well, so that there's not any <coughs> question at all. Uh, and you don't want I, it's clear you don't want any question um, and it's clear you've chosen writing and we're actually thrilled that you very know, much somebody's coming in excited ready to invest in the community in many ways so I think we just um, clear up the form because there doesn't seem to be much substance here and once that's done we're two weeks out I don't think it interrupts anything along the way as far as your ability to do business does it no no Good. It's, and it's important that you understand that we appreciate you being the gatekeepers and the gatekeepers that we have that will you know, keep our streets safe. Uh, we are gatekeepers for our employees and for our customers. 
So we 100%, two weeks is nothing. And, uh, we just get it fixed and we're going to be yeah, great for as far as I'm concerned. And we're excited. Yeah. Yeah. All right. any, any further discussion on the motion to continue the hearing? All in favor? Okay, 4 0. We're continued till the 19th at 8 30 p.m. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, Kevin, do you have the other notice up? We're going to, yep. the, the other applicant is not here, so to comply with the requirements of the law, we have to read the hearing and then move for continuation. Okay. Read the notice of the hearing. Um, Let me get the right one up here, yeah. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the Board of Selectmen of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on May 5th, 2015 at 8.45 p.m. in the Selectmen's Meeting Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on an application for an an all alcohol restaurant liquor license for Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza, Reading LLC, EBA, Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza at 48 Walkers Book Drive, Reading. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the town manager's office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7 30 a.m. to 5 30 p.m., Tuesdays from 7 30 a.m. to 7 p.m., is attached to the hearing notice on the website at www.reddingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on May 5th, 2015 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us. Okay, and we can go right to the motion to continue. Move to continue the hearing for the new look of license for Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza at 48 Walkers Brook Drive to May 19th, 2015 at 8.40 p.m. Is that motion seconded? Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Okay, we are continued uh, on the Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza. New liquor license until uh, 8.40 p.m. on May 19th. And with that, we have arrived at a very nice topic to be discussing. Um, naming of fields and or ballparks. Uh, Mr. Fudo, would you like to step up or Mr. Vicaro? Mr. Vicaro is actually going to go first. A little bit the, uh, Phil, little Phil little take the hot seat. All right, on time tonight. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of folks here. Okay, we'll just take oh, yeah. a second and let everybody come on in. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Hmm. First, I'd like to thank the uh, Board of the Selectmen uh, for this opportunity to present this um, naming of the ballpark after Pete Moscarello. I had sent the letter in uh, to the board, and I have a little change that I'd like to go over as, as I present. Mm -hmm. um, I'd first like to apologize for my lack of um, I, I should have been more aggressive with this. Uh, Pete's been retired for a couple of years now, but I, I certainly doesn't diminish the great work he's done over his career. I'm here tonight to re uh, recommend the honoring of a true legend, Pete Moscarello. By naming the Birch Meadow Field the Pete Moscarello Park, what we are doing is similar to Washington Park having the John Casino Field. So the Birch Meadow uh, field, baseball field, would now become the Pete Moscarello Park with the Morton Newton, field. Newton Morton Field. This proposal respects the integrity of the current Morton Field while honoring Pete. Pete, the math teacher, the math department head, the baseball clinician, the mental toughness instructor, the RMHS Baseball Hall of Fame coach, the Mass State Baseball Hall of Fame coach, a fabulous role model, model, a mentor, and a great family man. There will be additional speakers here tonight, as you can see, that will validate his nomination. But please allow me some time to give you some statistics of Pete's career. I'm going to go over Pete's career as a, as a baseball coach. Um, as a math teacher, I worked under Pete, worked with Pete in the math department. He was a fundamentalist. He, got, he was a caring, loving teacher. 
He made his class flow. He showed interest in every one of his kids just as he did as a baseball coach. He's in the uh, Reading Memorial High School Athletic Hall of Fame, 2002 Mass Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame, 2011 Eastern Mass Umpires Association Bill McDonald Award, 2011 MIAA Baseball Coach of the Year, 2012 Mass, Base, Mass Baseball Coaches Association Presidential Award, eight times Middlesex League Coach of the Year, 1996 and 2007 Boston Globe Coach of the Year. Many times the uh, Daily Times Chronicle Spring Coach of the Year. This is my favorite. 1997 Sons of Italy Coach of the Year. 2003-2010 Team awarded the Massachusetts Alliance for Promotion of Sportsmanship. 2009 MIAA District B Sportsmanship Award. He belongs to numerous uh, professional committee uh, committees and associations as a coach and as a teacher. If personal values could be measured by financial dollars, that is, if we could measure the value of character, ethics, integrity, wellness, commitment, sportsmanship, teaching and family, Pete Moscarello would be on the cover of every magazine as one of the richest people in the world. <laughs> Pete did not just talk about family values, he lived them. Uh, here tonight is Gil Condon, who played, uh, Pete played for in high school as his high school coach. The admiration that Gil had for Peter was so high that he named his first child Peter because of his love, his player, coach, uh, respect for one another. In my positions as an athletic director 18 years at Rennie Memorial High School and two years in Linfield, I evaluated and mentored many wonderful coaches, none better than Peter. In my current position as an assistant director with the State High School Association, I teach, I teach coaches education across the state. When coaches ask me, how do you handle this situation? What will you do when this parent comes or a player has trouble or there's family problems? Uh, I always answer by thinking, what would Coach Moscarello do? Because Coach Moscarello just didn't shoot from the hip. He took all his great knowledge and wisdom and high values <coughs> and he processed for what was best, not for the immediate, not, not for the immediate situation, but lifelong lessons. And again, as a coach's ed instructor, we teach the, uh, we talk about the teachable moment, that time in a practice when a coach stops something that's going on and he either corrects it or he um, applauds the great work. And I know Pete was one of the first coaches to take that attitude. In my vintage, when I blew the whistle, the coach, the, my players would cover their ear and say, what's Mr. V gonna yell at me for now? But Pete never took that attitude. When Pete stopped the play, he stopped it in such a pro polite, professional, but get it done manner. I could go on and on about the man I respect and admire and truly love. But with the risk of being too redundant, I will yield the rest to our great batting order that follows. Um, Rick, now batting. <laughs> you, you can talk from there, or it'll pick you up if you want to, or you can come up. No, I'm fine. If great. everyone could just identify themselves and their address, <laughs> their street address. My name is Rick Cotter. I'd rather not give my street address. But <laughs> that's not, uh, 15 Pondu Lane already. Uh, Phil called me and I was very honored to get the call from Phil to talk about our friend Peter Moscarelli. He was very specific. He says, two minutes, talk about your son. Um, I might defer, if I could, one of the minutes for someone who came down to visit us from uh, New Hampshire. There. Very quickly there, uh, everyone's going to talk about um, probably some of their highlights with Peter Moscarelli. I'm going to tell probably one. Uh, 
and it, it does have to do with my son, and I think I know why Phil would want me to talk about my son. Uh, I think uh, Peter's greatness had a lot to do with uh, my son's efforts with baseball and all that. To make a long story short, there's only two people who's ever had their jerseys retired at Reading High. One was my son, uh, one was Steve Langone. Steve Langone had all the records, all the stats, uh, had a heart of a champion, uh, by all accounts a great teammate, um, just loved baseball. My son had, did not have the stats of a, of a Steve Langone, did not have the records. Um, he had the heart, he loved his teammates and loved baseball and uh, Pete honored him by retiring his jersey there, which shows to me it's more about than just the sport. As, as Phil says, it is about family values. Um, so the day they, uh, they retired his jersey, my son's jersey, uh, I was very proud of it, but I think I was almost just as proud of Peter Mascarello that I could know someone like that um, that would really think of the, the kids first there. Uh, and I'll leave with this. He blogs all the time there. His, his, his best blog is what I always think about Peter there is uh, two coaches beginning of spring training. One coach says to the other coach, how do your players look? And the other coach says, I, I don't know, I'll let you know in 10 years. And that's what I think of Peter Moscarelli. Um, I was going to talk for a few minutes. Could I let a friend of mine, Mr. Hollingsworth, speak for 30 seconds here? I'm going to move the batting order a little bit. <laughs> um, Ken Hollingsworth um, is in more Hall of Fames than I can imagine down here running high there. Um, I, I asked him, and he's been following this, and he's been asking me to come down there. Um, he just went through it with his father, getting the Hollingsworth Field named after his dad. He knows what, what an honor it is there, and I think he just wants to say a couple words on on what, what it would mean to Peter Muscarello to have his, uh, have, the, have it named after him. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken Hollingsworth. I live in Tilton, New Hampshire. Formerly of Reading. I love Reading. Always love Reading. And I love what Reading does for its students and for its student athletes and its legends. I, I look at Walter Hawk's Fieldhouse, for some of you may or may not know that name. Um, Morton Field, and as Ricky said, uh, John Hollingsworth Field, I can tell you that when that happened for my dad, it was one of the greatest things that ever happened in his entire life, and we still talk about it. We go by and see the field every time we go through Reading. I just wanted to share, Pete's always been my hero growing up, and I wanted to just share one small story with you. Um, Nate Terry is a player that used to play for Pete a couple of years ago, Coach. Um, and he is now taking one extra year of prep school up where I work in New Hampshire. And Nate is playing baseball for me as I'm the baseball coach up there. And Nate had a wonderful pitching performance. He shut someone out and on the drive home I picked up the phone, I called Pete, and Pete spent 15 minutes on the phone with Nate. And when Nate hung up that phone, the face was unbelievable smile. And my point that I wanted to make is that Nate no longer lives in Reading, he lives in New Hampshire, he's no longer playing for Pete, he's playing for me, but the element of Pete Moscarello as his mentor, as his coach, will stay with him forever in the way that it does for every guy that ever wore the, the red and black for Reading. So Pete is the greatest figure that we could ever, ever, ever have in that name and opportunity. So thank you for your time. Scott, we go up. <coughs> My name is Scott Farris. Uh, I played for Pete uh, in 1984, 1985. Um, from the very first week of tryouts, I knew I wanted to be <clears throat> beside Pete and learn as much as I can from him. Not only about baseball, because I recognize right away what an extraordinary baseball person he is, but I also learned quickly what an incredible person he was. His passion for baseball is great. It is superseded by his passion for people and, and helping them grow. Um, the stories that Pete loves to hear from his alumni are stories of successes of their lives off the field, um, more so than any win on it. It is, it is those traits that has kept me 
not only his friend, but his his coach for his assistant coach for 20 years. There was no doubt in my mind that once I got beside Pete at the varsity level, I wasn't going anywhere else. There was nowhere that I was going to learn about baseball or handling and helping people than being by his side. It is his loyalty and his integrity that led me to ask him to be my son Colby's godson, which he is. There's those same traits that has kept us friends for all these years and has kept me, uh, it, which led us to be business partners as well. There's also those traits in, that, that when we're naming, when naming something uh, like a, a baseball field, which by the way, Pete spent 45 years of his life on as a player, Pony League on through, coaching Pony <coughs> League, coaching freshman baseball, and then coaching varsity. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a field that he has left a lot of hours, a lot of love on, and it is where he has taught so many kids uh, the game of, game of life. Um, when we think about naming, naming a field after somebody, and if we wanted to solely base this on Pete Moscarello, the coach, you, you heard the stats, that alone would weigh heavily in the favor of, of yes. But if we're going to name the field after, after Pete, the person, which is, which is more important, then this decision should be a lock. Thank you. Stephen Gaff. My name is Steve Gaff, uh, two pitch court in Wakefield. Uh, I played for Coach Muscarello from 2000 to 2003, and uh, I just wanted to say that it's such an honor just to be here to, to speak, uh, you know, for, for Coach Muscarello as a player. Uh, I'm sure there's you know, hundreds of other players that could be standing up here probably saying very similar things to me, and some of them are here in the crowd now. Um, but you know, what I want to get across, I guess, is that uh, Coach Moss loved the game of baseball, and he respected the game of baseball the way that it was meant to be. Uh, he would always tell us that it was his best part of his day to come down there and to be there with us, to coach us, um, and we didn't want to, we didn't want to, you know, make him upset or, or, or get him off his game there. So we were always trying our hardest to, to bring our best effort every day. Um, but the best part about it was that it was our, the best part of our day too, as players, to be down there with Coach Moscarello to practice under him um, and just to to play the game and to learn from him uh, what he stands for. Uh, <coughs> Very fortunate for me, very fortunate for, for all the players. But there's no question that he's the best coach I've ever had. And I've, I've played three sports in, in high school and I played in college. And um, you know, like then I'm just very, very fortunate to, uh, to have had the opportunity. But he's also one of the most inspiring people that I've ever had uh, the chance to play for. He's taught us uh, life lessons that. Uh, you know, I won't soon forget, of course, and, and um, I guess what, what I'm just trying to get across is that he loved coaching, he loved, he loved being on the field, but what he taught me about um, becoming a man, becoming a young man, uh, was just priceless. And it's something that I will carry on forever. Um, you know, we're so fortunate to have Pete as a Coach Moscarello as our coach for so many years. And to have him, uh, you know, his name as part of the field uh, is 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 very. Uh, I think it, it's a lot, like like Coach Ferris said. So, thank you again for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm Jeff Pierce from the school. <coughs> uh, Jeff. Jeff. Uh, Jeff. Jeff Pierce, Fall Pearl Street. Um, I've been involved with the Reading baseball community for most of 30 years. I grew up in this town. Um, Pete's parents and my parents have been great friends ever since I was a kid. I've certainly seen everything <coughs> Pete's done. Uh, pardon me from reading from the script, but I have a, a lot of points to make, and I'll probably go quicker if I read them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm fully in support of some form of naming recognition for Pete Moscarello at the baseball complex at Birch Meadow. Anyone involved 
in the Reading baseball circles over the past 40 years is well aware of the enormous impact Pete has had with both the in interest level and success of Reading baseball programs, both at the high school and with our youth recreational programs, and continues to have that impact. <clears throat> that said, I think it's important that we take the role as guardians of the gate and ensuring that the integrity of historical naming recognition is maintained as intended by our predecessors. <clears throat> I grew up in Reading in the era when Newt Morton was a recognized leader in town civic and recreation duties and activities. In fact, he was my neighbor and, and park instructor uh, growing up in Reading. Newt is simply one of the handful of the most influential and prominent <coughs> citizens in Reading's history. To say he was the founding father of Reading Recreation would not be a stretch. I believe that Newton Morton Field could not be more deservedly named and should remain as such. <clears throat> in thinking of other ways to honor Pete, it occurred to me that though the field, now known as Morton Field, has been around since the early 1960s, to many it was just another town field that was sometimes used for baseball. Surprisingly, the venue was not considered by some as a, quote, ballpark. <clears throat> it was through the passion and dedication that Pete has brought to baseball in this town for almost four decades that led to the increased interest in the community for bettering the town's big diamond baseball facilities. In particular, private citizens rallied to raise funds <coughs> and obtain town approvals to enhance the Morton Field venue with an outfield fence, an electronic scoreboard, a brand new infield service, surface, and now this year with dugouts, followed hopefully by lights in the very yes, near future. That will happen. <laughs> okay. It can now truly and finally be called a ballpark. <clears throat> Speaking now on behalf of the Reading Bay Roof Board, we would be thrilled to purchase a crown for the school board at Morton Field that reads Moscarello Ballpark. Thank you. John Feudal Recreation. Thank you. I slid up the six in the batting order tonight, which I'm usually, <laughs> usually bat nine, so. Um, well, you got moved up, John. I did, I got moved up. You, you just Sometimes I didn't even get off the bench. Advance the runners. Uh, <laughs> the on the so, uh, for a six batter, you pulled right in there. Yeah, I, I see, I see, I see, I see. Can we get in there? I've been here enough to sit down at the table, so. Five had a stand up there. Thank you very much. I was so honored when Phil had asked me to, uh, to speak on Pete's behalf. Um, I played for Pete obviously in 1995 and he's been a very good friend of mine. My mother-in-law thought it was crazy that I was actually inviting my baseball coach to my wedding. Uh, who does that? I'm sure other, the other alumni have done that, but it, it's kind of strange in, in most walks of life to have your high school baseball coach at your wedding. Um, I just wanted to talk um, on behalf of my professional re relationship with Pete as the recreation director. And I was pleasantly surprised when I got here, I didn't know how I would be received for people like Phil, people like Pete that I knew personally, how they would treat me. I remember early going, um, Pete called me one day and he said, hey John, it's, and he got hung up on, should I say Pete or should I say coach? And he said, Pete. And I kind of giggled on the other end of the phone and I said, it's okay coach, I can still be coach, it's, it's good. And we had a conversation, we talked, and I got off the phone with him that day and I was really blown away at the fact that he had the, the courtesy and the, re, and the respect to even think about that he didn't want to just assume that I was good with that relationship being coach to player or friend to friend still and I really that really kind of set the stage for me going forward um, with a nice comfort level with someone that I was going to be working with professionally he's as meticulous and as detailed as you're ever going to meet um, but what I'd like to talk about is how he evolved as a clinic director um, he ran clinics for Reading Recreation for a better part of 35 years and I would assume 35 years ago things were run a little bit different Kids didn't come to clinics dropped off by parents. They didn't come with snacks. They didn't come with fancy water bottles. <laughs> they didn't come with lunches. Sometimes the parents didn't come, or generally the parents didn't come, and there was no expectation. Um, as the years went on, things changed. And as I arrived here a few years ago, and uh, into date, and Pete did clinics up to, up to uh, less than three years ago for us, the game has changed. And you needed registration forms, criminal background checks, 
release forms for kids at clinics. Uh, the list goes on and on. And what I marveled at was Pete's willingness to number one adapt and willingness to conform and willingness to do. And he always wanted to be the best at it. And I can remember so many occasions of talking to other clinic directors and saying, you've got to go down and watch Pete. You're new to this, go down and watch Pete, talk to his coaches, number one, before a clinic started of what he expected. He'd give a rundown, and they're epic. And Scott can tell you, and Mark Damasi can tell you, and Luch can tell you, Jim Lucci can tell you. They're, these rundowns are epic. We're going to spend 15 minutes with them doing this, and then we're going to rotate stations. It was just meticulous. And the quality and the time he puts into it uh, really stands out to me. Um, in general, I look at Pete as a local icon. Anywhere you go around the state and beyond, if you mention you're from Reading and you mention the baseball program, people know who he is. And that, to me, is just a tribute to what he's done and his, what he's completed in his career. Phil ran, ran, ran down a bunch of awards and a bunch of statistics that he, that he marveled with. But the thing that he'll probably like to highlight the most is the um, is the hundreds of players and hundreds of kids that he affected over the years. I estimated about 25,000 kids over 35 years went through that program, and I'm probably on the low end. Um, so I'm really proud to be up here to advocate for my friend Pete Moscarello. I don't really have skin in the game of how we go into the naming process. Uh, that can be vetted out by the Board of Selectmen that is uh, – is your call, but I, I, I can't think of a better person to recognize as one of our ballparks than Pete Moscarello. So thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, the, uh, the last, I'm going to pass this around. This is a letter that I received yesterday. Um, Mr. Crowley's here. His son read somewhere that uh, we were going to uh, have this process. And Tom Crowley was captain in 2011. I just want to read a couple of the highlights so we don't, uh, we got a minute and a half here. <laughs> the only thing that dwarfs the amount of time Coach has put into the Reading baseball program is the enormous impact he has had on every player that has passed through. Every year the roster changes. The faces look a little bit younger. And the alumni website for the statistics needs some updating. But what it means to be a Reading High School basketball uh, baseball player is timeless. Then he goes on and says, when I think about Coach Moss, the moments that stand out are the ones that have nothing to do with baseball. And this is really important mm -hmm. that when we talk about the character. It's the work ethic he instilled in me for the rest of my life with his constant reminders during field house days. I don't want to read them in case somebody from Burlington or Lexington. <laughs> okay. It's the way he taught me how to handle both success and defeat. The former by never being satisfied and the latter by figuring out what went wrong and fixing it. He goes on to say, no matter how hard I try, I'll never be able to, qual to quantify the impact coach has had on my life. And that was uh, Mr. Crowley's son that wrote that. He's a student now at Trinity College. Real character kid. And the saying goes, as uh, Rick was saying, that when, when uh, Joe Paterno won the 1988 national championship and they asked is, you know, what do you, you know, is this the best team you ever coached? And he said, let me, I'll let you know in 20 years when they grow up to be great fathers, great brothers, great sons, great husbands. And, and you hit the, the nail right on the head. That summarizes the character, integrity, and values of Coach Moss. So I want to thank you all. Yeah, we could all, uh, we only had about five minutes a piece there. This That's doesn't good. go well, we could all come back. We could all talk a couple hours about Peter Moss, so we'll can, I, can I read one more letter that we got from a, a town, town meeting member and a neighbor? Uh, Reading Board of Selectmen, I am writing in support of Mr. Phil Vaccaro's proposal to rename Morton Field to Morton Field at Moscarella Park. Although Mr. Moscarella ran an excellent and successful baseball program and was a great supporter of the Redmond baseball community, he was an even better developer of fine young men. His emphasis was always on doing the right thing and being kind and responsible members of your community. His support in and out of the classroom, as well as on the baseball fields, was always that of a great, positive role model for our children. 
Thank you for your consideration of this proposal, and thank you to Mr. Vaccaro for this effort. Sincerely, Denise D. Wire, 228 Forest Street, Reading. And thank, thank you to everyone that spoke tonight. Um, John, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, many, I think. I have many, I have <laughs> many How much thoughts. time we have? Um, <laughs> and we, and we, I'm sure we don't have enough time to really, you know, get them all out. So we're going to first, but we didn't want to uh, That's it. It'll it, be over. <laughs> um, I, I, I do want to, I would like to comment as a selectman that, you know, when you, when we're called upon, we're park commissioners, we're liquor commissioners, we're road commissioners, there's like all these things that we're responsible for. Um, one of the most important things we're responsible for is our citizens. And, you know, we've heard from um, many people, and this is just a, a, a very small, you know, select group of literally hundreds that would probably like to be here and like to be talking about this. Uh, many still live here, many live, you know, all around the country. Um, but the interesting thing that comes out over and over again um, about Pete Mosquerella and what I heard again tonight is great baseball coach. Okay, put that over here. Mm -hmm. um, but great person, huge impact on the community of Reading. It's students, it's citizens, it's recreational space, it's recreational opportunities. Um, it's emerging um, husbands, fathers, you know, guys who are busy now uh, tonight raking the little league field. Um, and who these are all people that were shaped and molded by Pete Mosquerel. We heard a little bit about it tonight, and it is kind of our job, you know, to recognize when something special happens. I mean, sometimes we do it with proclamations, sometimes we do it with a special week, and sometimes when there's a really special person, we have to do something more special. Um, and the idea of, um, you know, as Jeff pointed out, and I thought it was quite apt that, um, you know, Pete's leadership and his motivation to all the people around him um, cause that to be a ballpark, mm -hmm. you know, instead of a kind of a idyllic place where the dogs run around and once in a while you play baseball. Um, it's not that anymore. Although, you know what, the dogs still run around there. And yeah. It's an idyllic place to sit and watch baseball. Um, but it's a, it's a first rate baseball field. It's a ballpark now. And Pete Moscarello led the way. He inspired, you know, many volunteers. He's in, just as he inspired, you know, players. Just as he inspired students. Just as he's inspired his own family, you know, again, in many ways. Um, and you know, the evidence of it is all around. I mean, there are in this room, you know, a collection of of men that he helped mold, um, who are, you know, fathers and husbands and homeowners and business owners and teachers and you know, and financial people. I mean, it's kind of, there's an interesting piece of glue that holds them all together, though, you know, um, and it's Pete. Uh, you know, I, uh, I was thinking about this today. Um, you know, we heard from, we heard from Tom Crowley, who graduated a couple of years ago. Um, we heard from some really old guys in here tonight, too, that graduated a long time ago. Um, and, you know, I know that if we had enough time, we could. We've got thirty. We could have thirty-five speakers. You know, we could have one person speak from every year, and they and they wouldn't be happy because that wouldn't be enough. Hmm. You know, but you know, just personally, um, I, I came home today, and you know, um, and I watched my son put on his baseball uniform and go down and coach at Reading High School. Uh, he did. He does that because he was inspired by Peter Mascarella. Um, though, this is what the man's all about, and I think we have an obligation to act on this request um, in a speedy fashion. Um, so I'm mm -hmm. gonna have a motion as soon as everybody else has an opportunity to say what's on their mind. Hey, any other thoughts, Barry? Yeah, I, um, I didn't grow up in Reading, so I didn't have the opportunity to play. 
Coach Mascarella. I, I grew up in New York City, and actually, we had a really successful football program. And uh, we found out this year that our coach, who had been a longtime coach, had passed away. And everybody had sort of moved around. And you couldn't imagine from all parts of the country and the world the tributes that came in uh, to Coach Cohn. And, you know, I know if I played in Reading High, it would be, I would have that same feeling for Coach Mascarella. Um, we came to Reading, and my son participated in many of those clinics um, with Coach Farris. We actually worked out at your, at your facility. Um, and it was great to see Coach go walking around and just helping a six and seven year old kid just correct his stance. Like it would, you know, just, you know, we had other things on his mind. Um, but to just work with, with a little kid, uh, I thought that was great. But for me, the biggest impact was as a youth baseball coach, you know, as a, as a successful youth baseball coach in Reading or anywhere, anywhere else these days, probably the most important thing is make sure the kids show mm -hmm. which field to go to, which color pants to wear, make sure you get the, 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 the you know, the bag of balls and, and everything there. It's like herding cats. But I had went to a couple of coaches' clinic, coaching clinics on just sort of how to be a coach and the mental toughness clinics. And that just opened up a whole door for me about just not being the guy who brings the bag of balls around, but also how to really coach these kids. And I, kids that I coach right now, I see them, I haven't seen them in a long time, but they'll see me in the street alone Mr. Brown. And I know that, that that really matters. So, you know, whereas he coached lots of kids, he also coached coaches who coach kids. And that is a legacy that's probably as important as anything else. So um, I'm actually glad that we're talking about this while coach is still alive. A lot of times yeah. what happens is someone passes and says, oh, now well, we should have done it. I, mm -hmm. I think the time is now and, um, and it would be a great honor and you know, a ribbon cutting would be, would be great. But yeah. you know, a policy, you know, some, you know, we'll wait till someone passes before we do that. But I think it would be a great legacy while we do it right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd be in full support of that. Thank you. Wise, wise men once said uh, that there are four fathers in your life. There's your heavenly father, there's the great fathers of history, the great leaders of history, there's your biological father, and then there's this other person that comes into your life. And oftentimes that is a coach, like Pete <coughs> Moscarella. If you don't have any of those, you're not going to do too well. Have two or more of those, you're going to be okay. You have all four, you've got it made. Uh, Pete's right up there. Now, on, my kids went the track route, so they didn't benefit from Pete's leadership, but I certainly, uh, it certainly didn't pass uh, by me, all, all the things he accomplished here. Uh, Hal Croft, another great guy that we honored recently, uh, moved on to the school committee. Uh, those men are builders of young men. Uh, I saw that happen with Hal, and I'm sure it happened with Pete. So I'm so happy to see all of you here tonight, and we're gonna do him the honor he deserves. Thank you. Um, I, I'm being the, the, the newest person to Reading. I uh, obviously don't have any uh, personal relationship uh, with Peter. Um, I'm really glad that you all came out tonight. I'm just, as you were going through the stories, I'm just trying to kind of think back to when I was going through high school and, and playing sports. And, and I gotta say, I, I wouldn't have probably honored my, one of my coaches in the, in the manner that you were doing now. And I was just thinking, well, I don't know the man. Boy, would, would I be doing the same looking back on some of my coach staff um, mm -hmm. back then? And that's not a knock on them. I think it's just the opposite. I think it's, it's probably more a testament uh, to the man that Peter is that you, you all feel you're going sh to show up here and, and really you know, um, um, talk about him not just being a coach, <laughs> like, like John said. Let's put that to the side. You know, here's who he is, a man. Here's what he did for the community. Here's what he did um, for the sons of the community. So uh, I, I, I think it's a, a really impressive tribute that you're all coming out here tonight. I know when this came back up, uh, Phil, when you originally kind of brought this up to our attention, uh, I think a while back, um, to start to kind of get that, that ball rolling, I did reach out to somebody who has been in town for a long time, someone I, I, I trust. And I said, hey, I, you know, I don't know anything about this person. What do you know? Mm. And it's exactly, exactly what, what you all have, have said here tonight uh, about him. It's a person I, I trust explicitly um, in, their, in their character assessment of somebody. So um, I'm, I'm really glad that you did bring this forward. I'm, I'm, I'm off <coughs> for moving this forward as soon as we can. Thank you very much.
Anybody else who would like to say something at this point? Yes, gentlemen back. I'm Bill Condon. I just moved in that trouble remembering my new address. <laughs> 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 you used to live on Longview Road. Well, not on Longview Road anyway. I've known Pete Longer than anyone in this room. He and I started at Reading High together in the fall of 1968. He is a sophomore and I as a new math teacher and named basketball and baseball coach without a second of experience. I'm glad that something came good out of it. I was responsible for this meeting tonight, so I figured I could stand up and maybe I'd go home and tell my oldest son, Peter, he's not only named after a great man, but a large field. Mr. Halsey, would you like to yeah, offer I, a motion? Um, I would like to make a motion that uh, from this day forward, the baseball complex uh, located on and around uh, Morton Field be known as Peter Moscarella Ballpark. I second that. Okay. And is there any discussion? All in favor? 4 0. The motion carries. And the park is so so named. Thing, I just wanted to thank all the alumni that came out tonight. I got mm. numerous emails from people from all over the country um, that couldn't be here that wanted to be here. So this mm. is just a small showing of what sure. this alumni group does. It's a true brotherhood, and I'm really proud that we were able to get this done for them. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank, thank, you. You thank you. Thank you for coming. Hey, great decision. My pleasure. Great Thank decision. Pleasure. All the way. Yeah, Thanks a lot. Yeah. 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 Gra grab a cookie or two on the way out. Yeah, please do. Take some of them. Or I'm going to have to eat them all. Guys, yeah. grab a cookie on the way out. We got a ton of them. Cookies. Eat the cookies. That's awesome. Hey. That's awesome. Way to go. Thank you very Way much. to go. Thank Way you. to go. I'm going to have a nice to see you. You and I can get together. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Really yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Everything I've heard. Yeah. I'd have another cookie. Yeah. All right. Two minute break. What happened to our recycling?
I told you. Uh, now we got to have a big celebration. Care of the Good to see you guys. Hey. Mark, Mark, nice to, Mark, nice to meet you. I mean, you guys Mark's got a uh, family full of baseball players that played for Pete. Okay. His little brother. I coach for a lot of years. Me and my, and me and my son played for Pete. This is a good, this is a so good night, huh? Yeah. It's a great night. Say hello to your folks for me. Let them know what we did, huh? Yeah. No, and that's. I don't want to throw All right, I'm a Mr. D'Addario. Okay. Area of views and everything. Good evening. Besides, it's only the chair. We got work to do now. I don't remember Ron's co committee guy. I don't remember his name, but I remember him. He's actually the chair, isn't he? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants you. <laughs> okay, we're going to resume. Uh, our last agenda item tonight, last but not least. Uh, yeah. We're gonna I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. Recycle container for the lot behind CVS. And we like to invite the Climate Advisory Committee here. Ron? <laughs> oh, your right. compatriot. Let him chew. Okay. <laughs> okay, Jesse. Um, and then I'll give it to, to Ron to get the details. But mm -hmm. um, essentially, the, you can go to the map too if you want to have it as a big map. So the Climate Action. Uh, Advisory Committee has been working with town staff even before I was here on the idea of providing a recycle bin in this uh, CVS public lot that we have um, shown on the screen so <coughs> that businesses could then be encouraged to do recycling. So um, this did go before the CPDC sort of as an informal um, presentation to seek their recommendation and make a recommendation to this to this body who's ultimately the the one who's going to make any sort of decision uh, the CPDC had some concerns related to the maintenance of the recycling bin should something be left outside how's it going to be maintained who's going to ensure that there's not just trash left in front of the uh, the bin um, and I'll let Ron speak to um, how that'll be handled but um, ultimately the CPDC said that you know is you know they understand that if, if there are issues with the bin that it will be essentially removed that JRM will not tolerate that and it will be removed and the CPDC said all right well if that's the case then really that's that's how it'll go and they're fine with it so I'll let Ron go ahead and give the details on the proposal and sort of talk about any concerns that the CPDC had thank you Ron thank you Jesse appreciate it uh, David Williams is our chair First, thank you for having us here. And then, uh, also, to just thank you guys for a great time meeting. I thought it was really went well. So thank so you, much much. thank you for your note. Work yes, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, I think I heard everybody knows how lucky we are to have such good leadership. Uh, I, I, uh, as far as the the recycle bin, we've been working on it for quite a while. It's uh, it's being donated freely by JRM Hauling. Mm -hmm. No charge to the town, no charge to the retailers, so it's totally free. They're going to make their gain by what they pick up in terms of it's only for paper and cardboard. Um, we, uh, we started this way back with Peter uh, and uh, we worked a little early on, and I mean like around 2011, actually, I think. And then uh, we had Jean Delios help us uh, for Jesse. And uh, she had tried, we had tried to put it on private property, and uh, that didn't work. Uh, we tried a little bit with uh, <coughs> uh, the new construction, the new renovation. And we also, uh, with, I think it's uh, Jamie Mon, who has the site off of, uh, Wuben Street, and uh, for different reasons, uh, it didn't work. Um, and then we kind of went into hiatus where all the MF Charles building was being built. And then uh, we came back to Bob 
because we, we knew it was a freebie. And basically, I mean, bottom line is it's good for business because um, anything that the businesses can put in the bin, they don't have to pay to be cut, carted off. Um, so we talked to Bob a little bit, and there was something going on with CVS. We thought maybe we could get them to do it, and for one reason or another, it didn't work. We, we always tried to stay away from municipal parking because parking was such a uh, valued uh, piece of property uh, for parking, obviously. And uh, so when we realized the private property just wasn't going to work out, uh, the climate committee, we, we decided to take a survey. And uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see the survey, but um, we ended up, uh, that's, that's the survey, it's impossible to read from your, your seat. <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's good. Bottom good. line is, there you go, that's a lot better. You know, would, uh, would you or your business participate if the town offered recycling? We ended up uh, putting it out to about 12, 12 14, 14, 15 people. We got 12 back. And uh, we got a really positive response. I, I myself was a little, I was uh, delighted that the response was as strong as, as it was. Um, we asked if people were willing to walk if it was at the far end of the parking lot, which would be number two here. And uh, just about everybody said they would. Uh, we asked them if they had any suggestions. Pretty much the back fence was seemed to be, uh, yeah, the back fence where Jesse's pointing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we asked uh, if the receptacle took up a parking space, would you still want this free service? And there again, to my amazement, uh, only one of the people said no. And that included, um, we also asked uh, Bunratty Cavern, which Jesse, no, not Jesse, but uh, Gene asked us in specific, specifically to ask them. And we got a yes from everyone except Sims Jewelers. So, um, and then there was some, we asked for other, any suggestions, and basically, uh, but Randy Tavern asked if, if we could include glass in addition, um, and others wanted plastic. Uh, Keating's Law Office wanted a shredder. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's a bridge too far. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. So, uh, we, we got a fairly strong response. I think when we, with the strong response, when we went to uh, both Gene and Bob, I think. They felt a little bit better about the possibility of losing the parking space when the retailers around the uh, parking lot were, were okay with it. So um, we, we looked at it, David's looked at it, I've looked at it, Jesse I'm sure knows it. There's even a possibility we won't have to take up a parking space. There is a corner back there where the pole is. Yeah. It's hard to see it there, but it's actually, uh, it's, the, the lines are striped. It's a no parking area. It's it's fairly large, and it's possible that we might actually get it in there without losing a parking space. But I don't want to guarantee that. Um, the bin itself is called an eight yard bin. There is a picture of it. It has. Um, it is not the bin. It looks like a bin that opens. But it this only has, yeah, this, this is, will not exactly be the bin. We've been looking for this picture, Jess, I'm telling you. Yeah. We'll find this picture, now I know. Uh, the bin itself has, uh, this bin, it has openings on the side, at two feet by two feet, to <coughs> prohibit you from putting in mass trash. And on this one here, we're hoping we could get one like this. It has an opening of six inches. Mm -hmm. and maybe about six feet across that you might be able to slide cardboard, cardboard into. Um, it won't be this color. It, it, they have, uh, this is not the JRM only color. That's a little bit right. bright green. Yeah. It's, it'd be a darker green. Now, he's not sure he could get that 
oh, the one with the opening of six inches, but we would like very much for him if he could because I think it would make it a lot easier for people to slide cardboard into it. Um, thanks, Jess. Uh, all in all, uh, we look at it as a trial. It's a trial for JRM. If people put trash in it and he has to separate it, they'll only do that so long. And then, and, and on, on our side, if people tend to leave uh, clothing outside and stuff like that, then after a while, uh, I'm sure the town is going to decide that it just isn't working. Um, the Climate Committee uh, is very much for this. Recycling is, a, I mean, for, I think it's something like for every ton of paper you recycle, you save 7,000 gallons of water. For every, uh, every ton, it's 40% uh, savings in energy as opposed to making paper from pulp. So, I mean, it's a huge savings. Actually, all paper should be recycled. Uh, some of the people down there actually take, take it home and put it in their recycling at home, or they, um, they trash throw it, it away. They throw yeah. it out yeah. in the trash. So um, we think it's a win for business, and it's a win for the environment overall, and a win for the town. So we would ask you to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Bob, did CPDC actually issue an approval for this? Uh, it wasn't clear from... I think it was just comments, wasn't no, it? No, it was just comments. It didn't technically exceed any of the review yeah. thresholds, so... Okay. Uh, we recommended that they bring it before the CPDC. It also went um, before the development review team as well. Yep. So what's... Is the issue before us to, to do a formal approval this evening? Um, it's, it's certainly up to you, but uh, yeah, and with the understanding that um, we should assume we're going to give up one parking space. Yeah. And I agree with much of what Ron said in terms of a trial basis. None of us know exactly how it's going to work, but it, it seems like mm -hmm. a good effort. I have to say that when he first brought the idea to me, and I never <laughs> told you this, I thought, well, they must be recycling. I, I was really surprised to find out the, is the difference between business and residents, residents yeah. mm -hmm. that they don't have the opportunity or the requirement mm -hmm. to recycle as we do as residents. I was really surprised. Um, and then as I got to walk that area, as you can imagine, I do quite often, I was shocked at how many trash bins there are. Almost every single business has their own. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this is not very effective. So it's what's what's the real shame here, and what I hope could happen someday is they all get together. Yeah. Um, there's no reason that recycling should be way at the other end of the parking lot. No. There's yeah. plenty of areas where there's currently trash. Some of it could be trash. Some of it could be recycling. Um, but you know, to to an earlier comment and to some of Ron's remarks, uh, talking to the business owners was a great idea. But it is like herding cats. Right. To get them all to agree to something is a remarkable thing. <laughs> And it, certainly, uh, I know, also speaking for Gene, that we were very skeptical as to what they would say about giving up parking. Yeah. And I was really encouraged that they did. Um, I would strongly um, support doing this now, and I would, you know, as, as Ron well knows, say that we have to keep an open mind as to how it's working. And even if it's working great, um, if the MF Charles building fills in and the demand for parking is too high, and uh, we can't get uh, all the business owners to sort of collectively put their heads together and use their private property. You may have to pull it back. Yeah, I, you know, I think the sooner the better because if you tried to start this in February, <coughs> last February, you'd never get it off the ground, you know. And, it, and it's, it's going to be about getting people in the habit yeah. of walking across the parking lot to do it, you know. And, and you, you've come, I, I have to compliment you. I, when you started telling me you were going to survey the businesses to see if they were willing to give up a, I, I, I never who knew? believed that, uh, <laughs> that they would say yes to that. But it tells you they're socially conscious about it, these it's things. It's in the air now. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, it's just, a, it's a groundswell of it. Yeah. People know that they want to do it. I think if we give them away. Yeah. And if you should agree to pass this, the Climate Committee will work with JRM Hauling, we'll come up with a sheet for, for the re retailers, mm -hmm. and we will personally go around and talk to each one of them to uh, urge them to make sure now that it's there, because if it's not filled, even if yeah. there's no trash, 
if they don't fill it, it's going to go away. Yeah. So yeah. it's got to be filled. And that they monitor it themselves a okay. bit. Yeah. I mean, if they want it, this is going to be good for them. They don't have to pay to have it removed. Then they're going to have, because we're going to keep an eye on it ourselves, right. but it's to mm -hmm. our mutual benefit to make sure this thing works. I think it's great that you're willing to make that personal ask that yeah. you and your committee, because I think that's what it's going to take, frankly, is a you know kind of person-to-person -person thing to you know sure. change a habit. I got to meet a lot of people I never knew. Yeah. So it's not a bad thing. Kevin, um, you know, Ron, you, you brought this to me briefly the other day, and I, I I thought it was a home run. I still think it's a home run. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's one of those things that the biggest reason I think it's a home run is because it's a take back. If it's not working, it's not working. Right. Uh, right. It's not a permanent thing that you that you have to say. This is going to be it moving forward. It's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it could be a good thing for the for the businesses. I think they don't they don't realize how good of a thing it could be. Um, as far as to Bob's point, you know, maybe getting that parking space back. They may even say, "Geez, I want one of those just for me. Forget the rest of everybody else." Um, quick question on from a maintenance standpoint. Who's monitoring when it's full? When it, you know, when it, when it, uh, and things of that nature. Is it the is it the businesses? Is it you guys? Is, is it JRM? Is it picked uh, up on a regular basis? JRM. I think they're going to. They're willing to pick it up, <coughs> and I think they'll monitor it. They'll check it out. If you if you go into the lot like around seven o'clock. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's there's mm -hmm. nobody there. Yeah. Pretty much. There's yeah, I don't think taking the parking space now is ever a problem. Every, every time I'm yeah. in that lot, so I mean, it's seven. I well, it's ever even in the except, back park. Except Friday night. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Ron, I think Kevin, that they'll 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 find out what the what the pickup yeah. time will be. Is it going to? They they would love to do it once a week if it's full. I think they're gonna they'll do it and to see how long which which the average time to get the thing. So, they'll, so they'll, they'll do it as necessary? And yeah, my, my thought would be some of these businesses create yeah. a lot of cardboard. Could, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. And if they really embrace this, could well, get filled yeah. up quite quickly. Yeah. A lot less than a week, maybe two days. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I think his whole purpose in putting it there is to, to empty it as many times as he can. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's not, you know, boxes on the outside because yeah, yeah. they have well, haven't been yeah. there in two days and it's that's going to have to be policed. But yeah. I know, I know that's part of the yeah. rolling it out yeah. and try to be work through it part. But a learning process. Okay. So if there's something wrong, you welcome to right. call me or make a call to Tom Flanagan and try to get things organized. Right. Ron, what do you think is a reasonable trial period here? I don't know, Dave. Six months, a year. A reasonable yeah. trial period. One a year? I, I would say you got to get through a winter. Mm. Yeah, that's going to be the real test. From a snow plowing standpoint, anyways. Yes. To, to and from uh, will employees oh. actually go out? Right. And will you walk yeah. across the parking lot? Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, when it's snowing mm -hmm. and, I mean. An idea might be uh, May 19th, we're giving our uh, annual mm -hmm. review. Mm -hmm. And also Tom, Tom O'Leela of the uh, the community which is called Community Shared Solar. Yeah. That you have, he's going to come May 19th. He'll be talking to you. Okay. But you, we could think of it, our next review, not not this May 19th, but let's say when we come back next year. It should be a topic. It's either oh, it's yeah. either a go mm -hmm. or not a go. Yeah. But that that would be one year. If it's not working, I think right. it's... So unle unless it's mm -hmm. something... They, they may take it away before then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But unle unless that... Yes. Well, I don't suggest you put any date on it. Just no, I just think we should right. check in Strip. when you come yeah. back Strip to see us. How's, how's it going? And, and, and we'll yeah. know. We'll get you know, rather than say, here's your deadline. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't, I don't we'll see you. Know, I'm going to do that. That parking lot all the time. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we should have the trial period language in it at least. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I've written something. There you go. Yeah, right. just yeah. A couple, a couple of comments. Um, CBS was the one uh, business that you went to that actually didn't respond or commit one way or the other. It seems to me they're going to be the big, the biggest generator of Probably. cardboard of yeah. you know all those businesses yeah. there. So I think the success of the, uh, I mean you can have all the other all these other people use it periodically, but I think it's a big win if CVS uses it and and, and putting it on that far corner. Um, I, you know, I think might make it harder for some of those businesses to do it. I think Bob's point is that if it if if it gets a little bit of traction, 
to maybe move it a little closer to mm. kind of where those businesses are congregated. I know there's a lot of different bins. Mm. I don't know who's or who's and in, in, in their private, mm. in which is private and public. But if you're putting it all the way down there, I, 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 Barry, you know, there's a there's a bin on the other side of the fence, somewhere around here, but there's a bin. It's, we could put it right opposite that bin that's already there. That would definitely take a parking space. Right. But I mean, that that might work. It would be bin to bin. Um, on, on the CVS, just a note, we went to talk to them about the situation. The manager couldn't talk to us about it, couldn't tell us what they yeah. did with it, couldn't tell. So we, we had a right to corporate. We wrote the corporate. No answer. So dealing with them is like, I don't think the, the, the manager could make that decision not to put to Probably put cardboard um, and I'm not sure pay for it. Positive. They can't make that. decision. <laughs> and, and the payoff for the businesses, as I understand it, is that the less stuff they put in their own That's personal yeah. thing, yeah. the less they're charged. The payoff to, to, yeah. to the hauling company is the more they take, right. the more they make. So right. win, 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 yeah. win. So I mean, if if, if CVS uses it. It, you know, it, it's I don't know if we could ever talk to the person who can make that decision. But you can just see what they do with it, I and mean, you go down in that parking lot. They yeah. have their disposal, but then you see that stuff yeah. piled up. They're throwing it away. Um, I hope they recycle. I, mean, I hope they recycle. I don't know. I mean, it, it's just all mixed up with it. I mean, you, just, you can see it. It's yeah. all outside. Um, well, that that would. You well, dig in their website. Look for the facilities guy. Don't. Go, yeah. Don't go to the yeah. corporate. Right. You want to. That's who you got. He knows what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I, I tried to tell them if there's a way. Every time you open the door, all that AC goes out, all the heat goes out. It's like, gee, can you do something not to have that loss of energy? It's crazy. No, but in general, I think it's great. It's a great idea. We should try it. Yeah. Um, I would like to make sure that the design is such that, you know, you can't throw all kinds of other junk in there. Bicycles. You know, um, and I know it's probably we probably have some security cameras, you know, just in, in general out there. Big so, screen TVs. You know, just yeah. you know, in, 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 in general, I know the bank probably does, so you can see what's going on there. But um, you know, I think I think ultimately it, it'll be a win-win-win if you can get it closer to where the businesses are congregating um, and make it sort of a, a shared thing. But if it's yeah, successful at the far end in February, mm -hmm. then you know that maybe you could take that step and maybe having a couple of them get together, maybe using the chamber as a way to kind of communicate, you know, for they're all because I'm sure they're all members of the chamber to kind of get them involved as well to kind of sell it uh, would be helpful. Well, just to be clear, uh, are we going to move it closer? Are we? I, I, I think mean, where, where are we? So we're just I'm clear with that. Do we have I a, think the spot you identified that? near the telephone pole is the best starting place yeah. in the oh, back. Yes. Okay. Just so and I, I would I would suspect you're, you're going to give up a space just because you can't position it perfectly. Right. right. And then you have to empty it sometimes. Right. So if a car is there, you space want to give space. Empty. Right. So I we'll, think we'll, it's we'll in the empty. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. They don't. If they time it right, they won't have to do that. Or you can take up a parking space at a particular date. Oh, we don't also we also don't also want them emptying that at ten o'clock at night either. No, no. <laughs> Just for noise. Actually, <laughs> seven, seven in the morning is ideal. Right. Yeah. But they'll Before figure that out. We have hours they're allowed to do it. They'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I fashioned the motion here, Paula. I wrote it down for you. Okay. So, move to approve the Climate Advisory Committee's proposal for a cardboard slash paper recycling bin. To be furnished and installed by JRM Hall, is it Halling? Yeah. Yes. On the town hall lot behind CVS. Second. Does that have everything it needs to have. Yeah. Okay. For the discussion. Any, I'm sorry. Not putting any. Any. I could put more conditions in. I don't no, not conditions. You can always just sort of revoke it. Yeah. And it will. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on an at will basis or something, we could add. No, that's. I think Bob's I just right. Just leave it. We yeah. can. Yeah. Right. I mean, if it's not working, we. We'll pull it. Everyone yeah, will know. Actually, the, the, the Holland Company will pull it. Three hours. Right. Right. All right. Uh, further discussion by the board. Uh, all in favor? Motion carries 4 0. Gentlemen, thank you for your uh, thank thank good work. Special thanks to Jesse Wilson. She's walking us through this. Yes. <laughs> committees. No problem.
<laughs> thank you, Jesse. Thank you for everything you do. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Thanks for being out at 10 o'clock at night. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Wild and crazy guys. No, please. Go. Yeah. Thank you. Fill your pockets, <laughs> gentlemen. I, you guys. I think that completes thanks, our agenda. Is there anything else that needs to come before the board tonight? Nope. If if not, what are we, we doing here. Oh, well, this uh, is the change, uh, name change. Motion, motion to adjourn. Yes. So so moved. Seconded. Yeah. Anybody second the motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you, one and all. Well. <laughs>